Okay, people hanging out in the hallway, it's time to go. Hey, Lily, are we set? Audio working? Excellent. Okay, thank you all for coming to the May 24th, oh, I'm not supposed to stand in front of you. May 24th uh, Wayside Cleanup Advisory Committee meeting with free Wi-Fi. Had I not mentioned the Wi-Fi before? We, we now have free Wi-Fi. Yeah. Uh, and you know, you have to kind of acknowledge it. There's no password. And you know, there are those little glowing things at the top. Please don't stream movies while you're while while you're sitting here in the back. Uh, they do track that sort of thing that you know, and yell at. Yeah. Um, so uh, first off, uh, this will probably be our last advisory committee meeting before the summer, since our summer it's almost summer. Uh, we are having summer. And it's going, it's going to start for me in mid-June, unless I'm not going to be here for the end of, of June, for the fourth Thursday in June. And I have no qualms about uh, having Liz come up and do this, uh, except uh, she is taking off as well. Uh, so, so if we're not going to be here, then you guys should be here. Uh, so there are some things, and particularly with the regs, that we'll, we'll be tracking and that you will want to know about beforehand, so we will be sending out uh, more emails and information that way. Uh, just make sure that you're you're keeping up on things. Uh, but our next meeting probably probably won't be until maybe August. We'll we'll see. Uh, since we're skipping June, August might be in the works. Uh, the program update stuff. Uh, really, the, the only big thing, and I have absolutely nothing to say about it, is budget. Uh, it's working its way you know, through the system. I think the Senate is having hearings this week on the budget. Um, yeah. uh, so far, uh, nothing really to report uh, for, for DEP, except it's, um, there doesn't seem to be any surprises for us, and, and that's good. Um, because usually surprises are bad. All right. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Uh, so we'll just jump right into the, the PFAS. Unless anybody has any other thing, you don't really want to hear that we're going to lose a, another floor in this building, we have to consolidate, and we have all sorts of things going on with that. Uh, so there are kind of day-to-day -day things which are preoccupying us, um, but it's more interesting to us than it is to you to all of you, since we're going to keep the second floor. So it will all look the same to you, we'll just be more tightly squeezed. Um, so PFAS, uh, we are doing PFAS all the time. It seems like every meeting we go to is revolves around PFAS, so we'll, we'll do that today as well. A uh, couple things, one, we have, uh, we've been working with the Department of Public Health, I think we've talked about this before, and our Joint uh, Health Effects Advisory Committee. And they have been looking at uh, the toxicology associated with PFAS and looking at some recommendations that we have made uh, from our Office of Research and Standards on setting, on, on looking at multiple compounds. Our Mark Smith came and talked with this group uh, about a year ago, uh, kind of laying out the rationale for that, uh, this panel of, of experts that you know, we have available to us here in Massachusetts uh, has been taking a look at that and we expect that a, um, a final report from that group uh, will be available uh, 
shortly, in the next, in the next few weeks, I think the penultimate version is being circulated for a last you know, check on typos and things like that. Uh, so that report is important because that statement from our, our peer review group on you know, their opinion and their recommendations vis-a-vis -vis this uh, proposal looking at the five PFAS compounds and the toxicology and the assumed toxicity associated with that group of five and how we would regulate that. Uh, right, and by regulate, I mean it in a couple of different senses. One, and probably the uh, first thing that will come out of that will be a recommended uh, ORS guideline for uh, drinking water. And that value is used by our uh, water supply program uh, for public water supplies. So that should be coming uh, fairly soon after the final report. And then as we've talked about, there will be uh, MCP, GW, well, all uh, method one standards, including the GW1 numbers uh, associated with drinking water and reportable concentrations uh, for those PFAS compounds. So we'll kind of, that will be part of the draft regs that Liz will talk about, and I promise this time I'm not gonna say any more about draft regs. Uh, because Liz will be talking about that. Uh, so that will be coming very uh, fairly shortly after the final report and the ORS guideline. I do report of, so site-specific activity, we are in the meantime working with a number of different uh, sites and uh, affected public water supplies, uh, the Westfield Public Water Supply, uh, Hudson, uh, has lower levels not exceeding the, the guideline uh, or health advisory yet, but something that we're keeping an eye on and kind of looking, investigating sources for Hudson. Uh, there's the Devons and the Air public water supplies have had, had uh, wells with levels above uh, the, the proposed guideline and the risk values that we're using. Uh, and those systems have adjusted uh, taking wells offline uh, planning for treatment, that sort of thing. Uh, we've been meeting with the, for Devons and, and AIR, meeting with uh, the U.S. Army, associated with the, the Fort Devons cleanup to coordinate those efforts. So there's a lot going on on site-specific work uh, for it, um, including not only looking at the public water supplies, but also the uh, private wells and the, the small uh, systems, public water supply systems as well, that may be nearby to potential sources. So all of that's going on. And then you might have heard that there was a Peace Pass Summit uh, the last few days. Uh, and the, you know, the, the most you hear about is who got to attend, and you know, the, what, what gets reported a lot is who got to attend and who didn't get to attend. Uh, but they, they did have a day and a half uh, worth of discussions that uh, I watched the first hour or so, as many of you probably did, because it was live streamed, and then they shut the live stream off. Uh, and so that the parties that were there could have a, could more of a free exchange of ideas and discussion. Um, and they were breaking out into groups, I think. It would have made live streaming uh, a little bit difficult, so I'm told. Uh, we, I wasn't there. Uh, we we did have two DEP staff attending: uh, Gary Moran, the deputy commissioner for operations, and Mark Smith, who's the director of the Office of Research and Standards. Uh, they they are back today, and they have an invitation sitting, awaiting waiting for them on their email to come down and talk to us. <laughs> And I, I, I'm not sure that they, they would be prepared at having synthesized everything that they heard in the last day and a half. Uh, so if, if one or the other or both uh, come, I promise them that we would stop whatever we're talking about from now until noon and give them a chance. Uh, I also offered them coffee so we would have to run out and get coffee. Uh, so if they have a chance to, to come and talk, uh, uh, it would be great. I'm, I'm not sure that that will actually happen. We'll see. I, I still have high hopes for that. Uh, but it, we will be meeting with them. Uh, well, DEP staff will be meeting with them uh, to download what they, they have heard and try to synthesize that. Um, 
And that's really all I can say about that. Although all of the, the presentations that were made offline are available. Uh, you, can, you can take a look at, even though we didn't get to see the live stream. There's a, a link there which you can't read, but it is, um, it, it is online. We, we posted most of these slides before the meeting. Uh, so, and all you have to do is Google PFAS, PFAS National Summit EPA, and it will get you to, to those pages. And you can look at the videos of the, what was streamed and download presentations that were made in the uh, subsequent sessions after that. So we'll all see how this shakes out. It will be an interesting time. One of the things that we did learn, uh, it, was, it was mentioned in uh, the EPA administrator's talk at the National Summit, and we had met with the regional administrator, Alex Dunn, uh, before that, and had learned that following this national summit, which had limited participation, uh, there will be a series of meetings across the country. The first one is scheduled to be in New England uh, because we have so many sites in New England, uh, so many PFAS sites, and there's a lot of great work being done, particularly by Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, on this. So there was a commitment to bring the first uh, of this traveling roadshow uh, to New England. It will be at uh, the former Pease Air Force Base at the New Hampshire DES offices there on June 25th, uh, probably with an evening session, uh, the evening of June 24th, uh, to try uh, to hear uh, from the community groups as well. Uh, all of the planning is still in flux, but that's what I've heard uh, so far as the, the initial plans for that. So we'll see. And I, I think that will be broadly open to the community to participate. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about, uh, in addition to the site work we're doing, we are doing uh, taking some steps for uh, reducing or eliminating potential sources and following what some other states have have done, we're initiating a pilot project for uh, taking back stockpiles of AFFF foam that uh, may have the longer chain PFAS compounds in it. Uh, we announced that the other day. So this is being done in partnership with the Division of Fire Services. Uh, the, all of the uh, fire companies in Massachusetts uh, were contacted and asked to do a visual inventory of the stocks that they have and identify uh, materials, older materials that are known to have the longer chain PFAS compounds or might be suspect. Uh, and we've, we've heard from um, almost a couple dozen uh, programs so far, uh, or towns, I guess, uh, so far. Uh, with, I think it was about 3,200 gallons of this material uh, that they've identified. Uh, we've left it open to June 15th to, for people to do that inventory and to get back to us. And then uh, we, have, we have funds available. We will provide for the uh, appropriate disposal of these materials uh, for the fire companies. Uh, so we expect, to, we expect the 3,200 gallons to probably at least double uh, as time goes on. Uh, some of this material we're, we're finding, we, we would include as being suspect uh, because a lot of the containers that are in the fire stations are unlabeled. Uh, it's not sure exactly what's there. There was one company in Western Massachusetts, my understanding is that as the company was closing, they had a large amounts of uh, AFFF foam, which they uh, very generously made available uh, to the local fire companies and basically said, you know, come and bring five gallon buckets. So you have all of this material which uh, you know is foam, uh, but you don't know how old it is, you don't know what it's, it's um, made out of. And so we're, we're investigating both whether, kind of the cost benefits of just disposing of it uh, as uh, PFAS, longer chain PFAS containing material, or doing, you know, doing the analyses that would be necessary to figure out exactly what's in it, and then perhaps uh, giving it back to the, the fire companies. So you know, it's a you know, cost benefit there that we're investigating, but that's the sort of thing that we're, we're running up against during this. Uh, our SARS contractor uh, that we've brought on board will, will handle the disposal for that, 
And all of this is being coordinated through uh, Nick Child, who all of you probably know. Uh, and if you know of anybody that may benefit from this or you're, you want to put in plug to your local fire companies uh, to take a look at their inventory and because this is an opportunity for, for them to avoid the disposal costs uh, associated with the AFFF uh, suspect material. And with that, any questions about the PFAS work or any, anything else? Yes, ma'am. Just a very general question in um, relation to uh, coordinating with the fire departments. Is there, and, and I guess the Department of Health, is there an outreach for discussing the um, health effects or toxicity of these compounds to the firefighters? The reason I'm saying that is that very interestingly, I was watching a show on TV the other day, um, might have been PBS, I don't remember what it was, but it was an expose on firefighters and the high instances of cancer in Boston firefighters. And what they were all talking about was exposures during fires to particulates and, and hazardous chemicals, which is a, a real exposure. But they did not mention at all the exposure to the firefighting bombs. And so I was wondering if this is on their radar. I, I'll, I'll check more specifically with Nick, but I think part, uh, there is a fact sheet or letter that that has gone out to the firefighting companies, and part of it is the you know, health effects and the issues associated with PFAS. Uh, I don't know how, and they worked on that with the Office of Research and Standards to, to make sure that the language was appropriately targeted. I, I, I don't, re I, I didn't see it, uh, so I'm not sure whether it was written more towards the protection of the public water supplies and to what extent it talked about the exposures associated with firefighting. There's, there is a balance there. Um, uh, and, yeah, and, but yes, there, the, the potential health effects and the exposures associated with firefighting in general, uh, this would be included in that and kind of add to that potential. Oh, yeah. <laughs> So, given Rhode Island's experience in Oakdale and the firefighters, uh, fire station being the source apparently of the community contamination of local wells, are you prioritizing evaluation of private water, private well water supplies in areas where there are fire stations, who, particularly the ones who may have come and said, "Hey, we have this stuff," um, and are on well and stuff like that might have that route pathway. Uh, the answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is uh, that the department is developing and in, in the sh probably shorter term uh, will be uh, start conducting uh, m more aggressive public water supply uh, sampling associated you know, in and uh, around potential sources for that. Um, one of the things that has slowed that down is making sure that the, the lab at the Wall Experiment Station uh, is, has the, not only the equipment, but appropriately staffed and have the staff trained uh, and available to, to do the sampling. Uh, as you probably know, there, there continue to be limited number of, of labs, although that's growing, luckily, because the demand is there, uh, but limited number of places uh, that you can send the samples and the uh, with an eye towards the capacity and the turnaround, we wanted to make sure that, we, uh, and the cost, that this is something use of our lab would um, would make it easier to do that kind of outreach uh, and investigate work. So yes, that was a longer answer, uh, and it would look what we are looking at are, you know, the, the known or likely sources, including you know, airports and uh, both firefighter training areas and locations where. Uh, the material has actually been used to put out fires to the extent that that well, has been stored. tracked into, uh, and in the, the store, yeah. yeah. So yeah. that fire station, yeah, all of those, just, not just public air, public water supplies, but private, and and, and the private as well. Yeah, yeah. It's you know, it. You ask what we're prioritizing, and yeah. their prior their priority is, is the 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 public water supplies because of the number of uh, sources. But there are situations where, to the extent that we know. 
or suspect individual locations. Uh, uh, I think we talked about one out in Western Massachusetts where it was discovered because a, a new well was putting in for an elementary school and it had to be put in a location that was the area, a firefighter training area. So, I mean, that just underscored to us that it could be anywhere. In, in some ways, this reminds me of our, what we went through with perchlorate in the, in the fireworks. Mm -hmm. uh, and it could be anywhere where you know, that material was used or stored. Anything else? Okay, there will be more things that, so the PFAS will be one of those things that you'll be getting emails about uh, during the summer as we, we go through this. Uh, Julie next. Oh, sorry. You can ask more questions. Yeah, take, take, take your time, go. I have a lot of pictures. <laughs> Hi, welcome. I'm Julie Hutchison, Marine Oil Spill Prevention and Response Program here in uh, DEP. I uh, just want to give you a little bit of an overview of the program and what it's all about, and it's kind of a lead into the New Bedford Pilot Project and Clean Builds Project that will in uh, administration from the Coast Guard and Dan Crafton from DEP Southeast Region are uh, handling under the program. Uh, the MOSFET program really started because of the B-120 oil spill that happened back in 2003, caused the oil spill act to be passed. We found out that locals had no capability of preparing for the spill, and then a couple other things that we've been working on. So let's look at some pictures. Um, April 27, 2003, that was about 100,000 gallons impact, about nine communities in Buzzard Bay. Um, if you can see the red, it indicates where the impact was, what communities. Um, it led to the passing of the Oil Spill Act, which was actually in 2004. So if you look at a spill that happens in 2003, and there's actually some uh, legislation-based efforts a year later, it's pretty impressive because this was a pretty serious situation. Um, it, we do have an Oil Spill Advisory Committee. Um, we are funded through a five cent fee per barrel of oil that comes to Massachusetts terminals. Um, we created special areas of interest, which includes uh, Buzzards Bay and also Mount Hope Bay, and uh, kind of helped pull some different statutes and penalties were added under Chapter 21E. Um, one of the large successes and a big part of the program are the uh, development of geographic response plans. We've provided equipment to 70 local communities along the coastline and test both. Um, locations of where the, the geographic response plans have been developed from the North Shore all the way down the Cape and the Islands. Um, a geographic response plan is a map-based tool uh, that ex you know, establishes tactics and strategies to prevent impact to an identified sensitive area. They're developed with a consensus of stakeholders and professionals from federal, state, local, community. We had rooms full of shellfish officers, uh, bird experts, um, you know, town managers, we really, you know, shellfish, different parties that could have different expertise in looking at what should be protected. and. Uh, but the lines, you know, puts the plans together on, if you see the letters, you know, EX for exclusion, um, DB for diversion, on how you could move the oil around for shoreline recovery, et cetera. But the plan is really just lines on a map unless it is tested. So that, we've tied that into the uh, field exercises. Um, in equipment mode, we have 70, uh, sorry, 81 oil spill response trailers staged at the locations with the, uh, the towns that are noted. Um, each, we have the 81 trailers, each trailer contains 1,000 feet of boom. That's 81,000 feet of boom that we did not have in Massachusetts when the Bouchard B120 happened. We had no boom. We had, uh, you know, it takes hours, days to set up an incident command where you get the Osros, the oil spill contractors, coming in even from out of state in the sense of the responsible party. And myself, Dan Crafton, also responded to the, to the spill. And you just saw it coming ashore, you had nothing to do. 
and that was devastating. So to now have 81,000 feet of containment boom along the entire coastline of Massachusetts is a huge, a huge improvement. Uh, we maintain ownership of the trailers, the towns stage them and uh, don't can use them, but we maintain ownership. We've played our drills where we've um, called upon trailers, say, from the North Shore to assist with something that would be happening in the South Shore. We can say, hey, bring your trailer to this location because we need it for something else. So we would have that ready, um, you know, in a lot faster, a lot easier mode than having to wait till other contractors showed up. The trailers are maintained and restocked by one of our MOSFET contractors, Moran Environmental. Um, as you can see, they have about 1,000 feet of containment boom, all the ancillary ad uh, anchors, buoys, extruder, everything from safety glasses, um, proper uh, PFDs, life jackets, etc. cetera. Um, since 2009, we've put on 56 exercises, which are full-scale HC compliant exercises, that's home sin, home, homeland security exercise uh, procedures. Uh, we put six to seven on a year, usually in the spring and the fall, because coastal communities are kind of busy in the summer, and they don't want to train. So we start training, you know, now we're planning the ones for fall. We have trained over 1,300 first responders, and those are 1,300 people we did not have that could take any actions, which is, you know, that's an impressive number we're very proud of. Most of them are the fire departments, harbor masters, shellfish <laughs> wardens, um, and different entities like that, like some of the environmental police. Every town has different makeups of how they have their first responders um, you know, lined up and established. But the, in, the interest and the buy-in and the commitment to this program and to the, the training and the equipment is really, really impressive. Once we do the the field exercise, we actually take one of the actual tactics in the GRP for that area and test it. And a lot of times things have changed, things have been revised, areas have been rebuilt, you know, culverts have been moved, and the local knowledge, basically the plan is then revised if it didn't work. So then we learn from, from that and the plan has actually changed. The plans are also part of the area contingency, area contingency plans for uh, sector Boston and sector Southeast New England. Nuka Research and Planning is another one of our MOSFA contractors who is uh, key in developing and running this program. Um, the day starts with a classroom, about an hour in a classroom, and then familiarization with the trailers and the equipment, we've actually set up some stations where someone is actually putting their hands on boom and needing to put them together. You don't want to learn that on the water. Um, the anchoring systems, all that goes into getting anchoring systems ready. A lot of people think you just throw the stuff out there and make a circle and you're all set. Uh, to hold it in place, you need to establish you know, anchors in order to keep it where it wants to go. Uh, this is one we just, this is some of the spring ones we just completed. Uh, we always have more than one or two towns in Truro, Providence, Wellfleet, we have three. The National Park Service also uh, com uh, participated in this one, which is great because Cape Cod National Seashore is kind of a kind of a white elephant because it's huge. Uh, there's not a lot you can protect. Uh, it's really hard for people to see a beach like that, and it's like you can't boom that beach. So a lot of it is uh, kind of give and take in the sense of uh, the tactics and what can be done. But their involvement and their buy-in and their interest in the program has been interesting. So we may try to do some more. You know, we're going to try to do more exercises with them. At this one, we had DFS, the uh, Department of Fire Services has a rehabilitation unit for people, not animals, and um, also a, uh, a, uh, a resource. They have a rehab rehabilitation, and then they also have the uh, special, what do they call it? Well, the one for rehab is basically shelter um, to get inside out of the weather and that stuff, and then the other one has all the comms, the communication systems, et cetera, that are really impressive pieces of equipment. The fire departments are able to call those out or invite them to the exercises. So it's a huge addition for the participants to get used to that equipment too. Uh, Chelsea and Everett. Um, I'm from the, my, prior to having this position, I worked in the Southeast Region Emergency Response with Dan for decades. We won't get into numbers. <laughs> and um, so doing things in Chelsea and Everett and north of the southeast region is really exciting because I never, I didn't get, they didn't let me out. <laughs> so now I get to go the whole coastline, you know, I'm like, I'm fine, Nero. Um, so Chelsea and Everett, getting there was fun, but this was, uh, <laughs> I 
I don't know how to get to Chelsea. I do now. Um, the Mystic River at the Island's End. We did an exercise right there at the convergence of the two. Um, this was a, you can see on the bottom right where the boom is deployed. It's being deployed more in a chevron, like a, uh, almost looks like a bird, uh, kind of deployment so that you're trying to get it to exclude it from getting into the uh, Island End River by diverting it to an area for suicide recovery. And those areas have been identified based on their sensitivity, based on their uh, accessibility. Can you get a back truck? Can you get equipment to that location to actually recover the material? And a lot of, you know, you, people don't like to hear it, but you'd rather have it come to a sandy beach, which is easier to cover, you know, recover something from, from riprap and rocks and all that stuff. So, but this was a great exercise. Um, a lot of Coast Guard from Sector Boston who were very interested, a lot of younger uh, petty officers and stuff, but the um, Chelsea and Everett, their, their staff was really, really hands-on, really, really interested. We usually do uh, a GRP tactic, and now we've also added to the exercises, basically encircling a vessel that would be in a harbor or you know, just out, out away from shore sinking or something, and how would they put the boom around that? Because again, you need to put in the anchoring systems, and that is something that they may be more apt to do on a regular basis. We did an exercise down in Marshfield, and um, about two days later, they had a fire, a vessel on fire, and they were actually able to, actually were able to boom it around it and do some, uh, know what they had learned and, and put it into effect, but that's not what we, that's not what we want. Uh, just recently, one of the last ones for this spring was Westport and Dartmouth. If you can see on the top, <laughs> the top photo, those are jet skis. Westport Fire Department has wet, uh, two jet skis <laughs> that they, <laughs> this is the first. A lot of people want boats out of this program. Now we're going to be asking them. You know, people are going to want some jet skis. <laughs> we don't give out boats. Um, but they use the jet skis to take the boom, the line for the boom, and pull it offshore out to the boat because, you know, they can get certainly closer to shore. And really, you know, excellent resource. Julie? Yeah. Can you use arrows to do that? No, <laughs> no, but the town of Bakushnit has actually figured out how to deploy boom using just putting a line on a drone, and then droning it over to a shoreside team, and then they pull the line and get the boom that way. And they've also uh, uh, shortcasted it, the same idea. No more farming on jet skis. Just to throw the line over and then pull it over. So there's a lot of ingenuity that's going on. Um, but the jet skis were fun because they actually have big firefighting, you know decals and stuff on them. We didn't get any, they were having some fun out there. We didn't get those yeah. photos. Um, but that's the boom on the bottom in this exercise. They put out about 800 feet. Uh, you know, it's, it's great looking orange stuff until you try to heave it. It's very heavy. Um, it, it comes in 50 and 100 foot sections which you put together to, you know, meet the needs, you, you know, what length you need. Um, we use an incident command structure down on the left. That's the incident commander, one of the chiefs from the fire departments, basically laying out the plan, who's going to do what. The towns need to provide vessels. Um, initial planning meetings usually start a couple months ahead of time. We have a mid-planning meeting phone call and then a final planning meeting to just make all the logistics and stuff are in place and everybody shows up. And we get a lot of great press. We really do. As long as they know we're from DEP and not EPA. Um, we do. <laughs> yeah, we did good. Um, we made the front page, and this is a, well, this goes back to 2016. This is, this is Orleans and Chatham, I think, and we actually made the front page of the Cape Cod Times. But uh, we do invite selectmen and our, um, you know, local reporters, uh, different town managers, because this is another job that is being requested of the fire departments, and the town just may not know that you have this equipment, this is what you're doing with it, and this is what's expected of you, or, or we want you to. If someone doesn't do it, we make sure that they know they're not going to get in trouble. I mean, if we have something happen, and, and uh, they should have put in, you know, BHO3 diversion, you know, tactic five should have been deployed. If it was dark out, if the weather's bad, if it's not going to work, you don't have personnel, you don't do it. Safety is number one, and you know we always say the state isn't going to come down and say, "Hey, why didn't you know you didn't do that?" Um, which a lot of them, a lot of them get very gung ho about wanting to take their boom, and when the when the where's the wood? Was it wood here, Paul? Um, <laughs> when nothing bad happens, to actually be able to run out and put it around the tanker, or you know, 
boom off the barge and it's not quite the capability. This is for shoreline protection. Really in the first, say, six, four to six hours of news of a spill coming. This is before it gets there. You want to be able to do these protective strategies. Uh, a couple of the things that the program has going on. We require tug escorts for barges and uh, tugs coming through uh, Buzzards Bay and the, and the, the, uh, the Commonwealth. A lot of people don't realize that when you know a barge is basically just a floating vessel full of petroleum products or other products, it doesn't have any you know engine or any capability of its own. So a tugboat is in the back of it, what's it called the notch, and it fits right in there. And the tugboat is pushing it. Well, a lot of times the tugboat has to move from pushing to pulling based on current. So it dislodges from the notch, scoots around the front of it, ties on a line, and pulls it. Now that time that it's kind of out there floating around is a big risk note, you know, big risk time. So we require tug escorts, right now they're industry paid for, companies pay for them, to not definitely just be nearby. They don't need to be in contact, they don't need to be, you know, taking any assist, but if they need it, they're there, and that's the kind of thing that would be, you know, would have uh, B1, B120 have even occurred back in 2003 if, if that was done. Bouchard is still an active company, and. They always have a tug escort. <laughs> um, another thing that was accomplished was we put a navigational aid um, in the uh, east end of the Cape Cod Canal, in, uh, about I don't know, a few miles off of Sandwich. This is a big part of the uh, the act also that was to you know to help with this again. Would this have helped with Bouchard 120? A lot of times, if you were coming in uh, the Buzzards Bay end of the canal. It was not known what the sea state would be at the other end because there wasn't a lot of live data. Some of the data has a delay to it. And when you're looking at tides and weather and sea state, delay is, delay is not good. Um, this is our buoy out there, uh, station 44090. It's, uh, ports is part of the NOAA system. So if we actually looked up NOAA, put in ports, they have it on the, on the website. You can get into the Cape Cod Bay area. You can see our buoy and data is just streaming. You know, sea state, winds, tide, uh, wave height. It's very, uh, very interesting. All right, did you all catch that? That was fast. Um, following up now is the New Bedford Harbor mystery spill. This is one of our largest projects that's been going on for a long time. Dan Crafton and the administration are going to talk about it. Um, we've put a lot of money into it to date. Um, it's about $200,000 to date that we've invested in a lot of efforts um, and they can talk about the effort, the frustration, the success, and the future um, of the project. And really, it's, a, it's good. But it is one of the things that are being funded through the MOSFER program. And um, you guys are up. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, my name is Dan Kraft, and I'm the Section Chief of Emergency Response in Southeast Regional Office. I'm going to talk a little bit about a problem that we, along with the Coast Guard, the City of New Bedford, Fairhaven, a lot of other agencies for many years have been trying to fix. Um, and unfortunately, with little success, but I think now we're starting to gain some ground. Um, this is a picture of New Bedford Harbor. Um, this is State Pier. And this would be looking south down to where the NSTAR facility is. And unfortunately, that's not all that uncommon to see, you know, oil spilled in the harbor. In fact, there's an oil spill going on right now that we're responding to. New Bedford Harbor is um, home to somewhere between three and 400 fishing vessels. And it is the largest fishing port in the country in terms of value of the catch. So they bring in more money and seafood than any other fishing port in the United States. So what is the problem that we're trying to deal with? Oil spills continue to occur in New Bedford Harbor, and we have no identified source or responsible party. So going back to that picture, 
Anybody want to guess where that came from? You got a lot of boats, and it, that could actually be more than one spill, too, because sometimes when there's one spill, then somebody says, oh, yeah, there's one. So let's add to that. So, and um, Lieutenant Tracen is going to talk a little bit more about what they do and some of the things they to try to catch or figure out who did this. Uh, and there's a reluctance to report spills. Nobody wants to be the guy that blew the whistle or that got the government down on the docks. Um, and I can almost promise you that anybody who was working on a boat that day did not call that spill in. <laughs> uh, lack of awareness of the problem. So people, after a while, just become used to seeing this. Uh, there's oil in the water again, big deal. Poor waste oil management practices. Um, we talked to the oil distributors. And they tell us, these are the guys that sell the oil to the fishermen. They don't get much of that oil back. They're willing to take it back if you would containerize it, put it in a drum or a bucket or whatever, or they'll come pump it out of your engine directly. But a lot of the oil that gets sold to them does not come back. So the question is, where does that oil go? And then lastly, there are limited waste oil disposal options. Um, if you don't buy your oil from certain distributors or you're a very small operator, it can be difficult to get rid of it or we also have problems with oily filters or oily rags oil filters um, and of course oil bilge water this is a map of new bedford harbor um, you have new bedford on the east uh, the west side rather and town of fairhaven on the east side that picture that i showed you in the very beginning is this little area right here uh, the circles on this map represent the number of oil spills that were reported or observed at that location. Um, and this covers the period of 2005 through 2015. Um, so you can see there's quite a few spills um, in this area up in here, and then there's a smattering of oil spills throughout the harbor. And this very large circle represent 71 spills we were not able to plot on this map because we didn't have location data. It just said oil spill in New Bedford Harbor, but weren't sure where. So as you can see, there are quite a few oil spills. Um, and there's and a lot of the times they occur on the, on the east side and the New Bedford side where most of the fishing boats are anchored. Um, but sometimes that oil spill doesn't stay there. It might blow across the harbor, you know, or it, it, it might drift into that area. So they can occur just about anywhere. And this graph shows spills reported to the National Response Center since 1995. And it kind of looks like maybe we have an increase in oil spills. But what it actually is showing is that the number of spills reported is increasing. So people are becoming more aware um, and they are calling them in. Most of the spills that are called in are called in either by the city of New Bedford, town of Fairhaven, or the Coast Guard. It's extremely unusual to have a spill called in by one of the boats that's actually right there. And you can see in the last two years, um, we had 70 spills reported. There's been three this week already, and I think 2018 we're on track to at least meet this. But I can assure you that in 1995, there were more than seven spills in the Bay Harbor, because most of them weren't reported. So how did we get where we are? In the 1990s, uh, the city of New Bedford hired a consulting firm, HMM Associates, to do a study on pollution sources in the harbor, and they focused primarily on waste oil and um, sewage. And what they found was that waste oil discharges in the harbor were probably the single biggest threat or pollution threat to New Bedford Harbor compared to anything else going on down there. Um, they determined that as much as 250,000 gallons, a quarter of a million gallons of waste oil was going unaccounted for every year. And some of that may be going to waste oil burners or whatnot, but still it's unaccounted for. And they made several recommendations to, you know, things that, that could be done um, to help solve this problem. Those recommendations are all still valid today, but unfortunately none of them were implemented back then. Then in the 1990s, an oil spill work group got together it consisted of uh, state, federal, local agencies, some non-government organizations. And they did a lot of work, and they were actually successful in getting a grant for almost $400,000 to 
to build a bilge water reclamation facility somewhere in the harbor. But unfortunately, they weren't able to find a location for that reclamation facility, and so the grant money went away. So it didn't get built. Then in 2010, the Harbor Development Commission, which is now known as the Port Authority, uh, used a consulting firm, Green Seal Environmental. They put together a proposal to build a fixed facility and was presented to the, the MOSPRA Advisory Committee. Um, but again, due to a lack of location and a lack of, uh, well, there were, there were certain permitting problems in order to have that facility, um, the facility never actually got built. So that led us to 2013 for a second oil spill work group. And the thing that really kicked this one off was there was a very large diesel fuel spill. Um, I believe it was in August of 2013. Uh, a lot of red oil all over the place. And again, no responsible party. So group of um, town, uh, town officials, DEP, others, uh, basically everybody on this list. Um, Coastal Zone Management, for anybody who doesn't know, is one of our sister agencies. And Nuka Research is one of DEP's contractors. They're the ones that do a lot of the blooming strategies that Julie was talking about earlier. <coughs> this group got together and came up with a plan to come up to do a pilot project to try to address this problem in a different way. We came up with a three-pronged approach that involved education and outreach. So we hired somebody that the fishermen all knew. Very comfortable working with this guy. His name is Rodney. And so Rodney would go to the different boats and talk to them about waste oil management, how to do things for the vessel to keep waste oil out of the bilge or to prevent oil spills. And then he would hand them information, brochures. Um, we put signs up around the harbor, so if you have an oil spill, call this number. Unfortunately, we've never gotten a call from a fisherman because of those signs, but anybody else who's down there knows about it. And so Rodney also went out and he said, hey, if you want to be a part of this program, we'll pump your bilge for free. And the reason we wanted to pump the bilge is, A, was to get rid of the oily water and, and help reduce the pollution threat, but we also wanted to get a handle on how much oily water are we talking about. Is it enough to justify building a fixed facility, or is it something that we can just do with a mobile unit all the time? So we started this pilot project. We hired a contractor, and they would go out maybe twice a month, and any boat that wanted to get pumped would line up and get pumped. Unfortunately, they can only pump maybe five, six, seven boats a day. Um, and sometimes they only got to one boat, depending on how much oily water was in the bilge. And then lastly, we looked at enforcement. Um, certainly increased patrols. The Coast Guard increased their patrols. The, the local um, fire department um, and the Harbor Masters, they increased their patrols, keeping an eye out on these things. We looked into surveillance. You can actually see oil spills on the water, even sheens with infrared cameras. But unfortunately, the system in place at the time couldn't handle the load of additional cameras. And then we also looked at regulatory enforcement from the DEP end. And we have actually started issuing notices of responsibility for threats of release when we find too much oil in a bilge. Because there's a pump in that bilge, and if the pump gets kicked on or something happens, that oil is going to come overboard. It's not really designed to store some of the volumes of oil you're going to see in a minute. So we started pumping bilges in October of 2015, and we did the first phase of the program for 18 months. We pumped 174 vessels. Uh, 39 of those vessels were pumped more than once, and that's, that's important. Um, 58,000, over 58,000 gallons of oily water were recovered. And of that, 18,387 gallons was pure oil, or 31%. And then the amount of oil we recovered from a vessel ranged anywhere from a sheen all the way up to 582 gallons of oil in the bilge. And so this graph shows the amount of oil recovered for each boat pump. And you can see in the beginning, there's a few of them that are up around 400 gallons, and this is 100. This red line across or bar across the bottom that represents 10 gallons which anything above that could be a threat of release and we expected to see this because these boats have all sat around for who knows how many years accumulating oil in the bilge and we thought that we would see a decrease in the amount of oil we recovered over time which is what we saw 
right here. But then it jumps back up, kind of comes back down, it jumps up and it stays up and it keeps going up. And what happened is we actually, by providing this free service, created a waste oil disposal service. So now, rather than try to keep oil out of the bilge, they were putting oil in the bilge. And I, I can't prove this, but I would suspect that at the end of heating season last year, there was quite a few gallons of waste oil left over that were then drained back into the oil of some, the bilge of some of these vessels. This graph shows the boats that were pumped out twice. Uh, the blue bar represents the first pump out, red bar represents the second, and I've sorted it based on the volume of oil in the second pump out. So you can see, these guys all started out really low. And you would think, well, if they're listening to the education and outreach part of this, they should go even lower. Well, no, they, they skyrocketed. Some people seem to have gotten the message, and you can see some of the blue bars have shrunk down drastically. But even, even in this case uh, right here, he went from 400 gallons to 80 gallons, and 80 gallons is still a lot. This shows the cost, the amount of money we spent um, on the education and the outreach. Uh, basically, it was a total of about $150,000, and Julie mentioned earlier, we're up to 200000 now, so the fifty that is in addition to that is what we spent on the second round, which I'll talk about in just a second. So what we learned, this is the big shocker, especially for me. Uh, many of the boat owners think it's okay to dump oil at sea. You're out there, it's dark, nobody's around, why not? And again, the tens to hundreds of thousands of gallons of waste oil going unaccounted for. I mean, you see that we recovered 18,000 gallons through this program that otherwise would have gone somewhere and not every boat in the harbor participated in this program. One of the reasons that these guys are willing to take a chance and go out to sea and dump the oil is it costs between one and $2,000 to hire a contractor to come down and pump your boat out. If you've got several boats, you can spread the cost among them, but still, that's a lot of money. But we also found out that not all the boats in the harbor are a problem. Many of the boats that we went on, you could eat breakfast in the village and you'd be fine. There was no oil down there. The boats were clean. They were very well maintained. Um, and some of these guys take a lot of pride in their boats. Other stuff we learned, bilge pumping service is definitely needed, um, whether it be a mobile uh, truck that goes from boat to boat or a fixed facility where the boats all come to that facility and get pumped off. Something like that is definitely needed. We also need something where they can take their oil filters, because the oil filter on a, on a fishing vessel is they're huge, they're not like the ones in your car. Um, they also generate a lot of oily rags, and if, if, if they do what we want them to do, where they use absorbents like you know pads and booms and stuff in their builds, then they're gonna generate all this waste material that they need to have a way to get rid of. So disposal options for that material are, are also necessary. And we also learned that this program is not unique to Massachusetts. Texas, California, and even Alaska have all wrestled with it and have all solved it. So we decided to re-implement the program and make a few changes. Because the first time, like I said, it turned into a wasteful disposal service. So during the first round of the program, we were asked, and the Coast Guard was asked, please do not come down to this pump out, because if you do, the fishermen won't show up. They don't want the government down here. They don't want the government on their docks. Stay away. So we did. This time around, no, nah, we're coming down. We're talking to them ourselves. Because the, obviously, the education piece didn't work the first time. So we're there during the pump out. There was a pump out yesterday. Um, one of the guys from my program goes down for each of the pump outs. Sometimes Lieutenant Tration goes down or some of her guys go down. And they meet with the fishermen individually and talk to them. They can't have all this oil in your village. What are you doing? And, and hopefully convince them that there are other ways to deal with this. We hired a marine surveyor, a marine safety consultant, somebody that all the fishermen work with. They, they all get their insurance through this guy. Um, they know who he is. He goes on the vessel after we've pumped it out and he makes recommendations, things they can do to minimize the oil in the bilge. And then lastly, we send a letter to these fishermen after their boat has been pumped telling them how much oil we recovered, 
whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, you know, give some, some advice on how to, to deal with it. And we also include the recommendations that the um, brain safety consultants provide. So in February of 2018, we started pumping again. And since then, not including yesterday, we've pumped 36 vessels. We've recovered over 13,000 gallons of oily water, over 4,000 gallons of waste oil. And again, I think it's kind of interesting, that number, 31%, still at 31%. But this time, the amount of oil ranged from a sheen to 785 gallons. So here's a graph of those 36 pump outs. You can see we have the, the 785 was one of the very first boats we pumped. Then there was a 734 and a couple of other ones that are pretty high. But then we got a lot of guys that are down here. And we seem to be averaging 20 to 50 gallons of oil in the bilge, except for these outliers. But then you notice that it starts to decrease. And now it's way down here. And we have our fingers crossed that it's going to stay down there. And Lynn's going to talk a little bit about why it might stay down there. If we take this graph and add it to the first graph, it looks like this. So that little increase there doesn't look good. But then we have this nice sharp decline on the other end. So hopefully that's indicative of um, improvements that we're going to be making. Dan? Yes. So you mentioned about the, you know the marine surveyor doing the follow-up. I'm just wondering. So that, right, they do have to have marine surveyors sign off so that they can get their insurance. They need their insurance in order to operate. Is there any way to tie in with that? I mean, uh, you know, well, that having was, all that oil in the builds would represent other insurance risks, right, to the vessel. I mean, it's a fire risk, it's a, right? Yeah, and, and we looked into that. We talked to some of the insurance companies. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of interest on the insurance company's part in the beginning because if they get tagged for an oil spill, and they rarely do actually, and it's very hard for us to catch them, um, they might get a fine from the Coast Guard of a couple thousand dollars. Okay. And so, so that's not a big just, liability. No. But um, it's going to start becoming a bigger liability because if you have a spill, then it's going to cost thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars to clean one of these things up. So at least by having marine safety consultants involved, that link is now there. So the insurance companies, I'm not sure how much information they share back and forth, but. Um, I mean, it just seems like if yeah. they, you know, they did the survey and you, you're, you're constantly having a problem with oil in your bilge and it's raising your insurance rates, then the financial incentive is there for the boat owner to say, okay, I gotta do something about this, right? Right, right. So we're hoping that that happens. Um, maybe the insurance rates start going up for people who are not you know, good players, but we'll see. Yes. Have you considered um, having some kind of a fine for a percentage of oil in the village and still doing it for free, but saying, well, if you have a certain percent oil, you're going to start paying a fine and or coupling that with looking at ways for the fishermen to get rid of their used oil more reasonably priced? Because it seems like there's no incentive for them not to dump the oil into the village. Mm -hmm. They're getting it out of there for free and then they don't have to pay to dispose of it. So is there a way to monetize that? You see what I'm saying? It's a good point, and we've thought about it, and, and Texas actually looked into that, and there's, there's actually a paper online that um, if you search hard enough, you can find it. If anybody's interested, I can, I can send it to you. Um, what Texas found is that if, if we have any charge associated with this pump out, there will always be a certain number of them that will not come. If it, be, it could be 50 bucks, and there's still somebody, well, I'm not paying that 50 bucks. You know, if, if, you, if it was something that reflected the actual cost, it might be a couple hundred dollars. If you would put a fine on it, so let's say, hey, come over here and get your boat pumped out. Oh, by the way, you had 300 gallons, here's your fine. The next time, they're not coming back. So we had to, I mean, during that first round, you saw all those really high numbers. That was really tough to, to, to not really say anything other than to talk to them ahead of time. Um, there are certainly lots of enforcement opportunities there. So it's a balance between getting them to be part of the program and come and have their waste oil offloaded or disposed of properly versus, oh, the heck with you, we're just going to go offshore because nobody's going to see it. Or on a foggy day in the harbor when, you know, nobody can tell what's going on. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance. Oh, yes. Um, 
Problem. No, it's it nationwide. Means, it's nationwide. It's universal yeah. up and down the whole coast, and mm -hmm. so the problem's only concentrating on New Bedford, both sides of the fleet. Well, a lot of the smaller harbors, um, with a lot fewer boats, the harbor masters and the people who run the harbor have the opportunity to work more closely with the boats that are in that harbor. Some of them have outlets for the um, for those you know the waste oil and stuff like that. Um, it's easier to deal with them. And of course, I just heard somebody say, yeah, it's easier to spot. You know, there's only five boats in the harbor. They're all owned by the same guy. It's obvious where it came from. So just a quick thing. We're looking at doing a build reclamation facility. We would love to put it on the waterfront. Um, but if not, we are looking at whether or not that thing could be located someplace nearby, off the waterfront. But then that would involve transportation. In, because Massachusetts considers, or considers oily water a hazardous waste, then that starts to involve transportation of a hazardous waste and there's permitting requirements and stuff like <coughs> that. The good news is if all we're gonna do is oil and water separation, no treatment, nothing else, just separation, <coughs> then we don't have to go down that hazardous waste treatment facility road. Dan, it sounds like you're coming enough oil to start to think about economic viability of energy recovery, aren't you? Well, yes, except that when that oil is in the bilge, yeah. it's mixing with seawater, and it's got antifreeze and whatever else they've drained in it. So you can't just take it out of that bilge and stick it in a burner or something well, like that. Well, I mean, the waste oil burners are kind of rugged and you know able to handle pretty much of a mixture. I'm not talking about throwing it in your you know home heating oil system. Like right. But well, I a mean, lot of a lot of the fishermen, um, and this kind of baffles me as to why they they put it in the bilge. They do have waste oil burners in some of the larger ones that have you know buildings where they run their operations. Sure. Up, they actually have waste oil burners. Right. And so yeah, they are using it as a fuel. Uh, just real quick, a couple of slides about Texas. Uh, this is what they've done, and they started this back in 2000. Um, the, let's see, the stars, the red stars are fixed bilge reclamation facilities that you know, a vessel can pull up to and get pumped off. The triangles are skid-mounted units. They're smaller. Um, probably there's not as many fishing boats in the area. They have waste oil collection, and they're looking at doing additional locations. But you can see Texas is, is really looking at this problem and trying to solve it. And they've done this, and they learned that unless we do this for free, they will not come and will continue to have this problem of oil spills. This is what one looks like. This is a very large one, actually, in Texas. Um, it's on the waterfront. You can see the water's right over here. And there's a sign that says, if you need to be pumped out, call this number, and we'll, we'll come get you. And this is a smaller one, a much smaller one, really. It probably fit in two parking spaces. There is a, um, a mobile trailer that they would pull up to the boat, pump the boat off, and then they would put it in one of these tanks. And in Texas, all they do is oil water separation, nothing else. The oil goes one way to be disposed of, the water goes another way to be disposed of. And what we're going to do is probably add a little bit of enhanced separation in there so that the water, when it's done, could hopefully go to a wastewater treatment plant. In fact, one of the guys that advertises this, this, this um, oil water separator, it'll get it below 15 parts per million, which technically if it's below 15 parts per million, it could go back into the harbor. Uh, but I think we're gonna stick with the wastewater treatment plant for now. <coughs> so that's it, questions? Okay, um, next up, um, <coughs> Lieutenant Tration, Lynn Tration, is going to talk a little bit about the Coast Guard and how they've been dealing with this problem. And she's probably going to go into a little bit about boats and how boats work and how this stuff gets <coughs> built to begin with. So, with the Coast Guard. I work at Marine CP Detachment New Bedford in New Bedford. Uh, thank you for having me here this morning and for the invitation. We appreciate all of Mass DEP's support and I think that this is working really well that we're working together using our different authorities to try to address this issue. I'd also like to highlight that 
yes, we look a lot at commercial fishing vessels, but other vessels also have these issues, tugboats. Um, it just so happens that in the Port of New Bedford, there are 400 fishing vessels. So that's why we're looking in that direction. There's other sources of pollution to the harbor, runoff from the docks or from the sewage outfalls. Um, but we can only tackle what we can, and we're working on this part of the issue. So when I first got to New Bedford in 2015, we kept having all these mystery sheens. And the topic kept getting brought up at monthly meetings that we had with the city of New Bedford, town of Fairhaven, and the New Bedford Fire Department said, you know, the Coast Guard needs to take a more active role in this, be more responsive. And so that's what we've been doing for the last three years. And so first we wanted to increase reporting, like Dan mentioned. Um, people are looking at these spills all the time and they're not reporting it. If it's not reported, we can't find where it came from or did any, do anything about it. And so that was step one and I think that we've made some progress in that area. Then we needed to gather information about what is similar between all of these spills. Are they diesel spills? Are they bilge slop spills? Um, are they just hydraulic fluid? What is common between these, all these spills? And to do that, our approach was we have the ability to take oil samples. Um, so we just take a jar and we take a sample from the water where the spill is and maybe what we think the potential source is. We can take these samples to our Coast Guard lab in New London, Connecticut, and they'll do analysis to tell us what products are in that sample. There is the potential also that if we identify the source, we'll get a match. And so then we can hold that company or vessel responsible. But to begin with, uh, we weren't looking to get matches. We were just looking to try to gather more information. And um, that's the part of analyzing data, what is similar with the information that we're finding. And then we want to figure out, okay, now that maybe we know that, um, because when we took these samples, we found a mixture of products. We found hydraulic oil, lube oil, diesel fuel, all mixed together. And that's, in our opinion, indicative of maybe a machinery space bilge in a vessel. Right, so these vessels have machinery spaces. We consider machinery spaces any area on the vessel where there's maybe an engine, a generator, or a fuel tank. In those spaces, there's petroleum products that maybe leak from the engines, which is normal operation. These items drip down into the bottom of the vessel. That's what we call the bilge, and they accumulate in that area. There's other sources of liquid that come into those areas as well, antifreeze, water, and that all mixes together to make a, a bilge, oily mixture, basically. So then we needed to figure out, okay, why is everybody pumping out their bilges? And then, you know, how do we correct that issue, education enforcement? And this is all going on simultaneously with the pump out program and uh, looking for other, other avenues to correct this issue. And so, just to clarify, these are not recoverable oil spills, typically. We do get recoverable oil spills, meaning that when you put absorbent material in the water, it's gonna collect something. If you go into, down to New Bedford Harbor on, you know, most days of the week, you can find a sheen in the water. And so, you could do something about this sheen, or you could just look at it. And, and of course, there's varying degrees. Some sheens are larger than others. But the point is, everybody looks at these most days and does nothing about it, because they think that it's weathered, it's old. And what I've learned for the last three years is you can never really know how old a sheen is. Um, because I've been at street diesel spills that are bright red, and then three hours later, now it looks exactly like this. And so the point being, our approach was every spill is worthwhile to respond to. There might be a potential to find some information that we wouldn't know otherwise. We've also had this um, conversation about, okay, how do we know that anything we're doing is having an impact on anything? And, um, and all this graph is to show is that the blue is 2017 and the red is 2018. And even looking back at previous data from different years, it's not really like you have all the spills in June or July, that's when they all happen. I think it it's really just varies. And so people wanna know, has anything that we've been doing for the last three years really made an impact? And I think it's very difficult to determine if it has. And so all this is pointing out is that, yes, spills are continuing continue to occur. In April, we had more in 2018 than we had in 2017 of last year. So the point is, I think we need to keep working on this issue because it's not gonna be until years from now that we know really if we've made progress. 
And so, as I was saying, when we took, those, took that oil sample analysis, um, we got the mixture of products. And surprisingly, we were able to find some matches, um, which is like finding a needle in a haystack. Every time a new petroleum product is added to a bilge, or maybe you get fuel for a different day, and that, that tank has a very unique fingerprint. And that fingerprint is constantly changing. And to get a match to basically just a sheen in the water and then just sampling any vessels that are in the area, that's very difficult to do. And when we did get these matches, they were all fishing vessels. And so that's why, you know, as Dan mentioned, that's also why, uh, besides the information gained from the pump out program, that's why we think there's a waste oil management problem is because the samples that we got matches from, they were from uh, engine room bilges that, make, that match to a sheen in the water. And so then we need to figure out why do people pump their bilges overboard. And come to find out, a lot of people think that, so let's imagine this is the engine room bilge. There's a layer of what people think is water, and then oil collects on top of the water. So some people think that if I just pump from the bottom of the bilge, I'm pumping water overboard, I can do that, that's fine. It, it seems pretty obvious that most people do understand that you could not dump black oil overboard or, or pump the oil. Sometimes they'll try to put like absorbent material in the bilge and soak up the oil and then they think, oh good, it's clear water. Unfortunately, um, Oil that has a con or water that has a content of oil of 15 parts per million is still clear water. So just because you can even look at the water and it looks clear, that's not that doesn't tell you anything. And so this was the issue that we found is it may be a practice that is leading all to all to the mystery sheens. Uh, as people are pumping what they think is water overboard, it creates a sheen. Hence, we have a mystery sheen. However, unfortunately, this shouldn't be an issue. Uh, back in the 1980s, the United States signed on to MARPOL, and we agreed that we were going to help reduce pollution from vessels. Originally, when they were making the regulations, all vessels over 100 gross tons were going to have to have an oily water separator. The vessels in New Bedford, they're all under 200 gross tons, because if you are over 200 gross tons, you have to be a credentialed mariner to operate the vessel. And so if any of you wanted to go operate any of the boats in New Bedford, you could go do that today with no training required. <laughs> so basically, right, everybody originally, if you're over 100 gross tons, you're going to have to have an oily water separator. And back in the 1980s, this equipment was not small. It was like a pretty large, and the engine rooms on some of these vessels are not very big. And so how would they have ever done this back in the 1980s? I'm not really sure. But through the notice of proposed rulemaking, this concern was brought up. And so they said, all right, here's the solution. We're going to let all vessels less than 400 gross tons retain oil in the bilge and dispose of that to a shoreside facility, or you can install an oily water separator. And so in 1983, this regulation came into um, place for new vessels. And then they gave them three years for existing vessels to come into compliance. Unfortunately, 30 years later, nobody seems to know about this regulation and it wasn't enforced widely. And so this is what we're using as a tool to try to help address these mystery sheens and reduce pollution from bilges. And everyone always tells me like, what are all these new regulations? Like stop making regulations. And unfortunately, you know, they're, they're from the 1980s or they'll say, you know, oh, my boat was built in the 70s, I'm good. I was like, oh, sorry, you're not. <laughs> so, like I was saying, um, there's two regulations. They say the exact same thing. For whatever reason, they make a difference between ocean-going and non-ocean-going vessels. It's just if you're ocean-going, you go three miles beyond shore. If you're less than three miles, you're not ocean-going. But the concept is the same. You have two options. You can retain your oily waste on board and dispose to a short side facility. <coughs> And when I first got here in 2015 and I heard of the pilot program, I was like, isn't industry, the people that are pumping out bilges, aren't they going to get mad at you that you're taking all their business away for free? <laughs> and come to find out it didn't exist. There, there's not an industry around this, which I think is 
really representative. You have 400 boats and there's no industry around pumping out bilges. That really tells you something. <laughs> and so I think it's really important that the pilot program exists in looking for the option of a shoreside facility because as we learn more, they really, there's not a great way for them to dispose of their waste properly. And of course, you could also install an oily water separator, which is basically just, um, it will take the liquid from the bilge and it has a content meter and it will read it as it's going through the pipe. If the content of that oil is less than 15 parts per million, then it will be disposed of overboard. And if the content meter goes off, it alarms, meaning that there's a content of greater than 15 parts per million, it will be directed to a holding tank and then be retained on board. None of the vessels in New Bedford um, or fishing vessels in general have this equipment. And it's a good solution, but not a great solution because again, if you install this equipment, which now they're, they're smaller, they're $8,000 to $11,000 for some um, basic models. You need to know how to use the equipment. You need to keep up with the calibration, filtration, changing filters. And then my concern with going this route is on our cargo vessels, foreign vessels that come into the United States or even U.S. vessels, right? They have to have these systems on board. And the Coast Guard has a lot of oily water bypass cases that we deal with. And so if every fishing vessel were to install oily water separator, are we just shifting the issue to a new issue of not having to then everybody has the right equipment and it looks like they're in compliance, but really they're just pumping everything overboard and not going through the oily water separator. So I don't know if that's really solving the problem. I think the better solution is trying to figure out how to reduce the waste that they're generating. And so to do that, because um, we these issues, again, as somebody mentioned, they're not unique to New Bedford. Um, in Honolulu, um, they're finding the same issues. And so we work with Sector Honolulu, and we eventually got the Coast Guard nationwide to issue this reminder that these regulations exist as an effort to get the industry on the same page. And so this is just, we do that with a Marine Safety Information Bulletin that we publish, and so now we can continue to hand this out to the industry, and it's on like the Coast Guard web pages and stuff, just to remind people that, yes, it's been a while since 1983, but this, these regulations do exist. And so depending on the type of vessel configuration, they're more or less likely to have issues with the amount of oil, water that they're generating. And so the point here is that vessels are set up in different ways. Some vessels have the engine room as the last space. It might be the middle space or maybe on smaller boats, all spaces that are in the bottom of the boat, they're all, they're all the same and the liquid can communicate. So if you think about that, you have maybe oil generated from the engine that's dripping into the bilge. That oil is now going throughout the whole bilge and maybe some of these small boats have automatic bilge pumps that are pumping from these spaces and just discharging oil overboard. Also of interest, and not to bore you too much, but um, where the tail shaft comes into the engine room, there is a bearing there. It's usually water lubricated. So you have water entering the engine room constantly. And so this is one of the sources of why there is so much liquid in these engine rooms, opposed to a vessel that has maybe the fish hold as the furthest aft space. That uh, packing gland, that water lubricated bearing that I'm talking about, that's now in the fish hold. And so you can pump a fish hold overboard because it's ice smell and it's just fish products. And so on vessels that are designed as in the middle, they might be able to comply more easily because they're generating less water. However, sometimes I find there's holes in the bulkhead between the fish hold and the engine room and everything is just flowing together anyway. So it just, just, because it could, just because it could be an easier solution doesn't mean that they're actually like taking advantage of that. Um, but we do find a real issue with it. There's a group of vessels called Eastern Rig vessels. That's the picture of it uh, on the top left here. And so basically on this design of vessels, the engine room is always in the aft. And so they're always gonna be generating more than they can maybe retain on board. The other source of water we find a lot is when they get into port on their way back in, they wanna wash down the engine room. So let's use a bunch of water and just put it in the village because it doesn't matter. We can just pump that water overboard. And so unfortunately, that's kind of what we're trying to do is figure out these waste streams. 
And so that's what we're working towards. And part of now that we're able to go to the vessels with the pump out program, we're having these conversations. We're looking for holes in bulkheads. We're identifying vessels where the engine room is the last space on board. Um, and talking about you could isolate compartments. Sure, you could install an oily water separator, but you don't have to, things like that. Overall, what they're supposed to be doing is they think they're generating more liquid in their bilge than they, they can retain on board. They should be coming back into port. They shouldn't be just continuing to fish and pumping overboard. And so throughout this whole process, we've been doing a lot of education. We walk around, hand out pamphlets. Um, we started with doing letters of warning, just, hey, um, this regulation exists. Please take notice. Fix your issues. However, it's very inefficient to give a letter of warning to every single vessel and hope that people are going to make a change. And we were finding with the lower levels of enforcement, even notice of violation for $1,000, that was having an impact on that owner, but it wasn't getting across the fleet. And so we were asked by the city of New Bedford um, to increase enforcement. The idea that if we increase enforcement, then people are going to fall, you know, get in line. And so. We had a community outreach meeting in August of last year with Max DEP and City of New Bedford, Town of Fairhaven's participation, and we let people know these regulations exist and we're gonna increase enforcement. And so uh, that's what we did. And so just, uh, I guess a couple weeks ago, we finally got um, a decision. So in August of last year, a vessel in New, Bed New Bedford sank um, at the dock and that discharged oil. And instead of just doing our low level enforcements, we referred that to the Department of Justice, and they did a judicial civil penalty for that case. And so just to explain a little bit why this case opposed to other cases, basically the reason why this vessel sank was because they were pumping their engine room bilge overboard while at the dock. And so they're doing this illegal practice in the harbor, and we also learned that they did this while underway, because it's pretty obvious, as I was talking about um, the design of vessels, they were an eastern rig, so they, you know, as soon as um, we learned what type of vessel it was that sank, we had a, a thought that if it, if it sank because um, they were pumping overboard, then maybe they were doing this underway. And so, to explain a little bit why, why, how would we find out that they were pumping their engine room overboard, is that this is a bilge manifold, and that bilge manifold has a pump that is pumping that liquid from the bilge, you know, up overboard through the deck. And when they're using that pump, they always have a priming line. So this line here is going directly to the ocean or the river, right? That's pulling water so that the pump doesn't burn out. Because it takes a little while for you to be able to start pumping a space. So this valve was left in the open position. And then they closed up the boat for the night and they didn't close that valve. And there's also a valve that goes to the engine room that was not closed. There is a check valve, which is a safety that's supposed to prevent water from back flowing into the engine room. However, unfortunately, that valve failed overnight. And so water was circulating into the engine room and eventually the vessel sank. When it sank, it also discharged the diesel fuel, um, which impacted uh, 17 birds, I think, it went over to the Fairhaven side. It was a red diesel spill at that point because the fuel was coming out of the, the tank vents. And again, it's not that the vessel had that the vessel sank. It's why it sank. Why we referred it to the Department of Justice. This um, action of pumping a machinery space overboard. That's the foundational issue that we're trying to change. And so, if they had sank for another reason, we would not have gone down this path. And the result of that is that company owns five vessels. And so now all those vessels are in a compliance program, which is important because commercial fishing vessels are uninspected vessels, meaning we have less regulatory authority over them than we do like a, a cruise ship or a, um, like a dinner cruise or a ferry. So we can't mandate that they change their vessel. We could keep giving them fines or whatever for what they're not fixing, but we can't say, um, you know, demonstrate to us how you're coming into compliance. But the Department of Justice with injunctive relief can do that. And so now these vessels are in this program and we're already having a lot of success with this. They have three vessels that I've already looked at. And so what happens is they go through a process of identifying what, you know, what are they generating and how do you minimize that generation. And so for example, this is their, their packing gland. Um, 
they repack this and come to find out now they're only generating like one inch of water in that area whereas before they might have been generating more water they're also reducing the water that they're using to wash down the engine room and so what we're finding is they're able to do a couple trips um, with their vessel set up the way it is and then they're going to discharge that appropriately to a shoreside facility and then so basically um, for the first year we will oversee a couple of their trips each year and then they're also required to keep a log book of how much oil they're taking on and taking off the vessel and that will be for three years and so overall the vessels had to as part of this settlement they had to join this compliance program they also got a um, a fine of four hundred thousand dollars and um, they're going to do a community outreach meeting and they had to do some education classes for themselves and so Yes, that fine is very high, but the most important part of uh, having the Department of Justice help us out is this compliance program and getting people to figure out the right solutions. Because now we have solutions that we can go to the rest of the industry and say, if you follow suit, then maybe you can avoid such heavy fines. Can I ask a question? Yeah. On the prior slide, the valves that you talked about didn't seem to have any, maybe I can't see it, any signage warning people, you know. To do and not to do. So, yeah. yeah, no, they, um, and they might have some, there, I think there might have been like a little label here that said engine, um, but it's very common for some of the valves on the fishing vessels to not be labeled. They don't have to be labeled. Um, and we've had three other boats sink, not because they were pumping their engine room, but because they were pumping their fish hold, which is um, they're allowed to do but unfortunately again they didn't shut the valves and then they were sinking two of them almost sank um, and then one did sink and so it's kind of common that we have problems with these valves yes so Dan mentioned that when you, they, you look at ships a wide variety in the condition of the bilges um, I'm just, just thinking you know EPA did a thing in looking at well, the, dealing with pollution from various processes and decided to go out and look at the industry and find out who was doing well and who wasn't and then find out what the people are doing right and then tell everybody to do that. And I just wondered, are you doing something similar? I mean, as you go through these programs, can you, you identify this? Are there other things you're identifying in the people who seem to have clean bilges you could eat off of? The rusty <laughs> stuffer there? Um, but, uh, you know, the, the, again, so sort of Share the knowledge across? Yep, and, and that's what we're doing okay. um, now that we're a part of the pump out program. Every vessel we go to, we're physically looking for what are some changes they can make, and those are being drafted into letters. We're talking to them. Okay. Um, when we, I interact with fishing vessels for other reasons. Every time I go on any fishing vessels, we talk about this issue and what their practices are. Um, we've been doing like email blasts with the city of New Bedford that goes out to the industry. In the MSIB that we wrote, there's some solutions that vessels could be using. And so we're trying to get the word out of different ways that they could comply. Any other questions? Uh, I, I would just point out kind of the, the question about the signage. A lot of the people in, in this room are used to dealing with facilities that are kind of highly regulated, you know, hazardous waste, yeah. you know, using hazardous waste, for example, where, safety in OSHA, where, you know, labeling of pipes and valves like that would be mandatory. Yeah. And, you know, this really underscores that it's a different regulatory yeah. universe yeah. Have dealing you seen with Wicked Tuna? <laughs> yeah, it's all yeah. I have to say. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's, that's one reason why, you know, as, you know, from the Wayside Cleanup Program, you know, I I feel like a fish out of water in this. The other and and part of all of this is trying different things to see that what works. You know, one way to do it would be if we had the authority and had the laws and had the rules. I mean, yeah, you could design. A inspections and mandatory reporting and you know, one could do that but we don't have those laws we don't have those authorities so we don't have those regs so it, it really is a different way of approaching a, a problem that overlaps with our regulated universe but it's not really subject to the same kind of requirements 
you would right. hope fishing boat owners didn't, you know, there was no economic benefit in having their boats sink, though maybe the marine insurance market is such a good thing. Yeah, and, and that's interesting. The, the thought with the insurance is a good one, and I, you know, a couple years, a year and a half ago or so, I called the insurance company, the agents, and I said, hey, you know, how could you help out with this problem? Because I heard that some rates were getting increased for drug overdoses and stuff like that because right. insurance was sick of paying for them. Um, and so then the owners started caring more about the use of drugs on board. But their response to me at the time was, a vessel only has one pollution case in its lifetime. Um, it, pollution insurance also covers fines. Uh, and so they just said the risk isn't that great. And I said, but there is a risk here. And they said, well, catch some more people and give us a call. So um, I, I owe them a call to see if anything was done and had an impact. But um, that was their initial response. But I do think, you know, what is a way, instead of having just more regulations, how can the system just correct itself instead of just uh, more regulations? That would be a better solution. And so, like we said, lots of ongoing uh, ways of trying to address this issue. We have brochures. We're also doing um, our boarding teams when they do uh, fishing vessel at sea boardings. They're looking at bilges. We track the vessels. Those vessels come into port. We have pictures. We look for differences in levels, and we are developing cases that way. Because one of the things that comes up all the time is, or if you're really focused on the port, then obviously they're just going to pump overboard offshore, and so. By using the at sea boardings and that those authorities, that's a way that we're trying to uh, decrease that risk. And, and word was getting around because everybody, I, I don't know, sometimes when I talk to people, I don't think they realize I'm in the Coast Guard because <laughs> then they were telling me, do you know the Coast Guard is doing at sea boardings and they're looking at buildings? And I said, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so I think even like that deterrent of like the potential that, yes, it would be difficult to to make a case that way, but just the impression or that we could potentially do that is maybe, because like you, like everyone said, the incentive to do the right thing is not there. And so we're trying to increase the incentive that it's more likely you're gonna get caught doing the wrong thing. So it's cheaper to just pay um, you know, $1,000 to get your bilge out, pumped out properly than have a $400,000 fine. So hopefully that's what you know people will start thinking. And then also we've been looking, working with the town of Fairhaven on a local regulation of you know how much oil can be in a bilge and prevent the spills from happening from that approach. So we're looking at all different ways to try to address this issue. And like I said in the beginning, it's a hard thing to determine what is success, right? You could have decrease in spills, but does that mean you really have less spills or you have less reporting? Um, I think a really important thing would be if the fishing industry or commercial uninspected industry started accounting for disposing of oily waste as a business expense. That's right now they're just not accounting it as an expense as it should be. Improved uh, shoreside waste disposal. So at the end of the day, even if they make it so that no water is coming into their engine room, their engines are still going to leak. That's how they're designed. And so there's going to be some amount of oil that needs to be disposed of, and that ideally would be to a shoreside facility. And so without those options being available, it's really hampering um, a long-term solution. That's why the fixed facility, the pump out program are so important because as we're increasing enforcement and people are concerned of how am I gonna comply, well, if they have an option to easily comply and we're pushing them that way, this would be a good time for all of this to kind of come together and happen. Um, and then I think overall, if we don't have a third working group of everybody talking about this issue, that would be the, you know, the most success. Because what happens is you get into this and then you realize how complicated it is and how maybe some people don't care about this and then you lose interest. And so and then a couple years goes by and then another big spill happens and everybody's interested again. And so hopefully we can prevent the third working group from having to be formed. <laughs> yes. So in other, again, trying to look at what's worked in other areas. So for example, you know, child labor issues and things in foreign yeah. countries and consumer products, then you get a big consumer movement saying, hey, we're not gonna you know, buy these products until you change your practices. Is there a possibility of reaching out? No. <laughs> <laughs> economy. Really? Economy. really? No, I'm saying, is there a possibility, you know, saying, hey, you know, the fish that comes from people who are doing these kind of things, you know, maybe you don't want to have a Whole Foods market or whatever. <laughs> yes. 
Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I, 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 is there any outreach to groups that do that kind of thing? So I, I've thought of that. Um, and so I'm hoping that we can find a solution without impacting the livelihood. Because at the end of the day, the fishing industry, unfortunately, they they have a lot of different requirements on them. And unlike a passenger vessel or a ferry that they can just pass the cost of pumping oil, you know, properly onto the passenger, every the more expenses they have, the less money they're making. Right. And they can't get that, you know, the fish market selling their fish for more that doesn't work that way. And so I think we're getting there where we're getting we're getting their attention that we can they need to address this problem, and so hopefully now that they're more aware of it, they'll make the right decision. I think a lot of it is a lack of education and lack of understanding of, of what is legal and um, because people honestly think that it's water below the oil and don't really see that they're um, contributing to the mystery spills, I think. And so I think if we get to a point that it's very obvious that everybody knows and they're just doing things illegally, I think that's a different, yeah, I think we're at the step of education and trying to get compliance. But if we're, we've done all this for years and we're not getting anywhere, then sure, there's probably other ways to try to get the point across. Yes? Do you have any idea how much, um, how many spills you have that are offshore, out of the harbor, versus what you're seeing? I mean, cause it seem, you seem to be able to quantify reasonably well in the harbor, but I would imagine, you know, you don't want to pe push people with just offshoring, it was mentioned. but. Any idea how much of that is already going on? So sometimes we get like satellite images of machines, um, but then again, who knows is that from a commercial fishing vessel? I think maybe the best con idea is the information we're gathering from like doing the at sea boarding and then looking at the bilges at the dock and seeing like if there are differences. Because I think when there, there's just nobody out there to report that a spill is happening. Big ocean. And so, um, we really don't have that many reports. We're all based on reports. Usually the Coast Guard is not looking for spills. It's kind of odd for us to be looking for spills and more work to do, but um, because we don't get the reports of offshore spills, we're not responding to them. But we get them, but it, it's just, I would say a handful, and we have no idea really to figure out where they're coming from. So more giving the image that we can figure it out and getting people to realize the prevention of discharging their bilge and what the risks are, I think is a more likely scenario than catching somebody discharging on their way. Um, unless we had like infrared cameras or something like that, which we're not at that level of technology. Any other questions? Yes. I wonder if you've looked at any specific fleets um, in the fishing industry in New Bedford, you know, some fleets are known for better behavior than others. And since this seems like partially a behavioral thing, if you could target specific fleets that you know have done other things that are illegal or not right. So I think there um, there are some companies that, you know, we can we talk to them and they have an explanation of where their oily waste goes and they've made steps to make sure that they're documenting and they're doing everything right. And then there's other companies that maybe that don't have those same processes and are maybe more likely to discharge. Um, so we talk to all those owners and we have conversations about what the right thing is to do, but unfortunately where the boats are set up in the harbor, um, you have a mix of different vessel and owners all in the same area. So for instance, I used to think all the vessels north of the Route 6 bridge in New Bedford, they're really good. Uh, there's a company there called Eastern Fisheries, which is a very reputable company. So I would think, oh, we don't really have spills up there. But then I learned that there's other vessels mixed in and come to find out um, those are some of the ones that have been discharging. And so it's um, just because of the location in the port, we don't always know that this is like a better area. And then it's also the idea of where does this sheen just end up? Because if we don't get the report right away, it might make an area look worse than it is because that's just where the currents and the tides flow. And so um, I think we have an idea if we like have a potential responsible party, whether they're more or less likely to actually be responsible. but. It, at the end of the day, we just respond to this bill, take samples of everybody, not like prejudge who is in that area, and then just see if we get any matches and go from there. Any 
any other questions? Thank you for your time, and if you have any um, questions or want to talk afterwards, just let me know. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, hold on a second. We're, we're, well, first, um, you know, you learn a lot about these things, like Sector Hawaii. That that must be like right below Sector Southeast New England as, as the, the goal, you know, the place to work. Uh, and uh, so, question: uh, How many years have you been working uh, up on the New Bedford stuff? And and how many more years are you going to be working? <laughs> Somebody else will be working on it. Uh, well, we have something for you. <laughs> what kind of work will you be doing then? Um, I'm going to go to grad school for math and then just math and business program. And then I'll come back to you. Just, I mean, Dan has been working with the lieutenant for, for many years, for all this time. Um, and you know, since I, I took my job, I, I come and go out of this, and like I like I said, it's uh, I I feel lost, and it's a completely different universe in it. So I rely upon you know you guys to help out. Uh, I go to the area committee meetings and have learned all of this. And you know, one of the things that you find, as with anything, is you know, and a lot of the work that you just heard about today, it really depends upon who's assigned to it and the initiative that they take, and. Uh, you, know, you can get more or less done. It's within the, the, the range of possibilities. And, and this particular project is, is very tough. Uh, and the reason that we've made any progress uh, whatsoever is because of the individuals that uh, have been working on it. Uh, luckily, we're, we're keeping Dan. <laughs> I, and we hope that the lieutenant's uh, replacement will be as dedicated and, and has, as helpful and as determined and as uh, much of a pleasure to work with. And we really appreciate you know, what you've done for the Commonwealth and for MassDEP and for New Bedford Harbor in, in particular. So we have a certificate. Thank you for all the work, and thank you for coming and, and, and talking about it today. Okay. okay, Liz, what are we doing next? Uh, reclamation soil. Reclamation soil. Uh, do we? Um, okay. We're about eleven forty-five. Uh, what's the timing? Uh, what did you say? Fifteen minutes? Yeah, or a little less. Yeah. Uh, and why don't we do the MCP amendments first? Yeah, if, if Jenny, Jenny, do you mind? No, not at all. <laughs> you can, you can just click right through it. Okay. Okay, so, um, MCP amendments, I just want to, we talked last time about the schedule, expect the public hearing draft out this summer. We are going to, you know, we're also working on the natural resource damages regulations. We also hope to have those out this summer. We will take into account the fact that it's summer and the fact that uh, there may be more than one reg package out there in terms of um, the amount of time that will be given for the public review. Um, don't have much more to update you on the schedule than that, except that it's not out yet. Uh, I, this is kind of an awkward time to talk about the regulations because um, because it they're not approved, <laughs> they're not out, and it, and so to talk about the proposals and you give us feedback, we just say, well, that's nice, but that's not what we wrote. Yeah. You know, wait and comment on on what's there. So we're not going to do that. It's this is more to orient you to a. Uh, three issues. Um, Brian's going to talk uh, briefly about the IPM uh, changes. He's done some of this in the past, so um, some of it will be review and um, also a little bit of, about the pilot we're doing that's related to the reg change. 
I'm going to talk about uh, the temporary solution changes, and the reason I'm going to bring those up is because I think they represent uh, more of a shift in what we're currently doing. So they're kind of a bigger proposal, and I would like the reviewers to um, to look at those group of changes as a whole. And this is a this is a proposal, but also looking for other comments on other tweaks or alternatives to what's there. So that's why I just want to highlight that in order to get the reviewers. I know the LSPA is in the room and others that uh, typically uh, review the regs to, to uh, kind of make that a priority in terms of their review. And similarly, Paul, it, we've received comments on uh, what's been discussed for the EPC changes and Paul's going to talk a little bit about that in the same vein. So, turn it over to Brian first. All right. So, as Liz mentioned, we talked a lot about um, this before in January. So, I'll kind of breeze through some of this stuff. Um, but I'm going to talk about the the numbers where we are now in terms of number of RTNs, uh, proposed amendments, and then um, a little bit about our pilot test that we initiated. So uh, where we are in terms of numbers of, of RTNs that have APOMS operating as of May, um, you can see 229 devices, and that's across 100 RTNs. So we're in triple digits now, that's nice. Um, definitely have seen an increase in the success rate of people implementing uh, the proper formatting that we're looking for and the ability to both do shutdown restart tests. So um, you can see we're at 190, uh, 190 that are completely registered, have done the shutdown restart test. We've received those messages and it seems to be working well. Um, and then some others, uh, 28, that are in some other various phase of Formatting changes haven't worked, haven't done the test, the test yet because they just registered or can only do a shutdown. And then um, 11 that the LSP has indicated is no longer required for whatever reason. Um, I did want to mention the online registration form is on the new website. So you can use that fancy search thing to, uh, to find it. Um, <laughs> It, it, the, it, it's a new form, so it, the form process is slightly changes. Before, it wanted to connect to your email on your computer and send an email from your email to our email, the, the BW, APM at BWSC. Now the form just goes in. So it doesn't, hopefully that'll alleviate problems. But if anyone has any problems with the new form, um, please let me know. Okay, quick question on those numbers. Sure. Do you have a sense of how many RTNs that are, for example, in a temporary solution that should have registered have not? Is, or is, is, is everyone sort of caught up to that? We did um, probably about a year or so ago try to identify those that had a temporary solution that should be registered and were not. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I don't know don't have a great sense of how many are still out there that um, for whatever reason we just don't know about um, but I, I, I'd like to think we've captured a lot of those and you know we have been presenting this information out here a lot and um, we've been doing some uh, site inspections of APOMs and um, hopefully the awareness is out there so people have registered them but I don't have exact numbers yeah, we can maybe rerun that, just, that analysis. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this, this slide I did talk about in January and just challenges that we have. Um, they are still out there, the same challenges. Um, we don't know if the actual service stopped the, um, the cellular connection or the, the, um, inter the Ethernet connection for the actual telemetry unit. Um, which we have an example of from our pilot test. Um, and then again, we can be removed without knowledge. And um, this language that's in um, 1025 3D, I'll talk about that in a minute. 
And then some messages are difficult for us to interpret if they're not in the exact format. We don't exactly know what they mean. So the proposed amendments, um, we revisited the, the actual definition of NABM. It's changing slightly to hopefully make it what it was intended for originally. Um, the registration process will be specifically outlined in, in the regs, including the requirement for a shutdown restart test. Um, clarify that uh, RMRs are required for APOMs that are operating, except for uh, after permanent solution. And then add in uh, a periodic shutdown test based on our request. The thought process in that would be kind of with the annual certification letter. So we would send the annual certification letter after permanent solution and request the owner to possibly just do a shutdown test, let us know when you did it. We get the letter back, say, okay, great, we have that message, everything's working. That hopefully will alleviate a problem with, um, you know, if the telemetry service is canceled or if we are removed from the list. Um, and then I'll talk about these last two in the next slide. So notifications, uh, the best way we've kind of come up with is to actually base the notifications off the vacuum measurement um, as opposed to a power on or power off of the fan. And then a placeholder for a, a new telemetry method, which we kind of talked about in January. So I just wanted to, so this is what uh, 40, 10, 25, 3D looks like now. And you have this bottom part, upon failure of the system, such as loss of power, mechanical failure, or other significant disruption of the effectiveness of the system. I've got a lot of questions as, what does that actually mean? So uh, this is, Currently, what our proposed language is going to be changed to. So, as I mentioned, we want people to measure the vacuum level in the um, extractor pipe prior to the fan. So, and establish a level, uh, a range, an operating range, that if the vacuum drops outside of that operating range, the system is then not protective of vapor intrusion. Is this constant? It, so, your to let your on the site, it's being monitored constantly, right. but it's not sending a constant feed to us. That's that's something different. So this is you have a, a pressure transducer there at the site, and it's programmed to say if the vacuum level drops below, I don't know, the design level, the design level then it would trigger a notification, okay. uh, which, which a lot of people are actually currently doing. Right. Um, there's just been some questions as to, oh, can I just do it to the power of the fan, meaning if the fan has power, it's working. I mean, there are scenarios where your fan could seize up and it has power and we're not receiving a notification, but your system is not working because the fan is actually not operating or there's a blockage or something to that effect. Yep. Are you defining acceptable range? So in... Or how that would be determine that range? Yes. Yeah, so that would be the question is are you defining how to determine the acceptable range, not what the range is? Right. Um, so there is language in the VI guidance, I think it's so appendix four? Yeah. Four, four, five. four or five? It, yeah, it's a minimum. That's right. For a vacuum under the slab. That's running a pressure on the slab, but I, I believe I believe there's also language in there that talks about defining the operating range of the, the vacuum. And I, I could check, but um, so the, the answer is we're not, that would be the responsibility of the LSP to, to define that range and then provide that range to us as part of the design of the system and then base the notifications off that design. So this is the vacuum of the system, not the subslab? Right. Correct. Not not like vapor monitoring ports throughout the subslab, the vacuum in the pipe, the extraction pipe. Um, so this is the possible new telemetry method, which we're going to try to put a, or we're putting a placeholder in the regs. Um, for people to use this potentially. And this is the continuous vacuum monitoring. This is the pilot test that we've um, started initiated here. So that would be
the continuous vacuum monitor and continuous reporting coming into DEP. Um, and so that continuous stream allows us to instantaneously know the system is running and that it has a vacuum and what that vacuum level is. Yep. Um, what do you mean by placeholder in the reg? I mean, is it going to be spelled out with a feature of effect or is it going to be but it's it's to transition the systems that are currently not operating this way so it would allow us to recognize that they're now meeting this yeah. okay so, so but, but I the guess the provision will be in the regulation yes okay. yeah and the placeholder is when you say transition it'll be like grandfathering or how to deal with both systems or something well this so tell me if this is all true, Brian. Um, we're, we're not planning on revisiting sites that have permanent solutions now that are based on the other systems. But the, this would, it gets an approval once they're, as part of registering a system under this new telemetry method. The regulations have a provision for that that kind of recognizes that you're now operating under this scheme. So it's written in there, so in anticipation that we'll be switching over to this way of monitoring. Okay, but it's in the draft. It, it's in the draft regulations. Yeah, yeah it, 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 because we're still kind of defining it with a pilot test, we, we don't exactly know what we want, so it's written basically, as Liz said, with DEP approval. And so if you are doing this constant vacuum monitoring, some of the other uh, requirements in terms of the shutdown restart aren't necessary because we already know your system is running. So you don't need that notification, if that makes sense. And, right. I, and I think maybe I have a further slide that kind of shows our pilot test, hopefully will illustrate that. But the goal is that we wouldn't have to go back and do another rank change. Right, to give people the opportunity if they would like to yeah. basically go with this constant monitor. So and is this going to need approval? Is that what you're saying? That it gets an approval? Is that how we wrote it? Well, it'd be the same. It would be the same as a registration, I guess. Right. I mean, right now the registration process okay. basically notifies us at what you're doing. You have a you have a APM, and here's your telemetry, and here's a shutdown restart test. So this this constant uh, continuous vacuum monitor would be the same thing, I guess. It would have a registration process. You would say, here's what I'm doing, here's my data stream, and then the data would start streaming. Okay. So that's different than approval. Right? So yeah, yeah. It's not. It's not a. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so it, it gives us more confident what's going on at the site is an advantage. It, it can replace some of the shutdown restart. Um, and possibly we've talked about if, if you are doing this, if it's your only reason for doing an RMR and now we know the system is running constantly, maybe down the road we can look to see if we could reduce RMRs. But those things are all kind of in flux. So, so just, I mean, I know this is in the... This, but I guess I have a conceptual question. So, you know, I, I think that it makes sense because that's what we should be monitoring anyway is the effectiveness of the system and that it's maintaining, you know, it's operating as designed, basically. So I think that makes logical sense. So my question is, you know, and, and this is on your pilot test slide, you know, there's going to be sometimes little drops for very short periods of time and then it'll rebound, you know, maybe something got a small clog or a kink but then it kind of rectifies itself. So DP is just getting all this, you know, it's streaming it on some kind of continual or regular basis, right? So when is there, quote, a problem? Like, so- There's no it, alarm. Yeah, right? like, so I'm just asking, right. like, so when, it, is there any obligation at a certain point to provide additional notification and the, that you're taking steps to fix it? Like, what's, what's kind of the- Well, there would also be an alarm. There, yeah. yeah, so. Yeah, but you don't it, want the alarm going off. Like, if it's a, if it's a right, five minute blip, right, you don't want right, everyone freaking out if it's right, going to rebound right, right, right away. Right, no, so, exactly. So, um, it would immediately then notify them again that it's back. No, should be the what? I, that, I mean, that, I guess that's why we're doing the pilot test. Yeah. Um, something we're trying to figure out. Okay. You know, there definitely is um, the requirement to. Uh, provide written notice to the DEP um, in an event of a 30-day shutdown. Right. 
and you are required you are required to um, take action immediately upon system malfunction. I, I forget what exactly well, that reg is. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. That, that's it. That is in the regs right now. That you. No, that part is. But right. this is different. No, but right. I, I mean, you're setting a new performance standard. You know. Yeah, I, but we should just wait. I think part. And also part of it would be that <laughs> once, you, once you take into account that we're getting this constant feed, you might say, do you really need that notification? Right. So that, that's part of the review of the regs. Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, ideally, if we have this constant feed with some LSP specified kind of acceptability range and variability, mm -hmm. then rules can be written in by, by programming rules, not regulatory rules, okay. can be written so that if something falls out of that range, uh, your know, notice goes out, maybe even not from the, the PRP to DEP, since we're getting that information, it might actually go the other way. That you know, if it falls out of the range you know, over some period of time, right. you know, and this is something that could be done operationally to figure out, okay, we can now see this. If we're getting reports every day and for like three days in a row it's outside, you know, the LSP and the PRP can see that, DEP can see that too. So kind of what's the best way to, at that point, to, to make sure that things are, are going and we can keep an eye on it and if changes haven't been made, it hasn't come back within the acceptable range after a certain amount of time, mm -hmm. then that could trigger other actions. So there are ways of playing out from an operational standpoint rather than a regulatory standpoint. Right, and, right, but I just thought like, so you keyed in on right. my big question, which is over what amount of time? Like, so we all agree that, you know, there's gonna be occasional blips and, and it's not gonna be, you know, a steady, vacuum level all the time and there's going to be an allowance for some variability over some period of time and I guess I'm, I'm asking is the LSP going to define that or are the regulations going to say that like for example on a monthly basis if it's out of range more than 25% of the time like 25% is on the RMRs as like you need to check an extra box if it's if it's if it's not functioning correctly more than 25% of that time period. So I'm just asking, are you contemplating putting some kind of like, you know? Yeah, that record? that has not been discussed, but that's a great point. Um, I, I don't think at this point we're gonna specify in regulations that you know, X dot dot. Yeah. yeah, okay. I think it's gonna be more in uh, uh, operate, well, the, the 30 day thing is going to still be there. Right, so this, this isn't replaces notifications. This is in addition to. Yeah, but at least you know all this. Right. But also, is that right? Range that this is operating. It's not a single line. No, I know that. So, 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 no, so, that so, is fine. so if you're working within a band yeah. and you've defined that band well, you shouldn't fall out of it. Well, you're. I mean, show, show her the slide. Right. You'll see. You do. Yeah. You, have yeah. 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 Some, you have some sites where your risk could be you could be exposed for 20 years before there's a problem. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Or you don't even have a race. You have a CP or something. All right. So <laughs> here we go. <laughs> so so this is our this is our pilot test. So we have two devices. Uh, they're separate buildings. Um, your your red line here is device one, what we call, and the blue line is device two. So um, it's, it's measuring in pressure in inches of water um, or vacuum. Uh, you know, the red one, this is from basically the month of May. Uh, the red one, device one, has been pretty consistent right around 0.3 inches. Mm -hmm. And then the, the blue one, it pulls a little bit higher, 0.35. But more or less cons on May 1st, we got a quick notification. That's probably about a shutdown or out of whack for like probably an hour. Um, the blue one is is a Wi-Fi connection, and then the red one is a cellular connection. Uh, the Wi-Fi one reports every 10 minutes, and um, the cellular one is every hour. So we are getting a lot of data. So that's why this this little measure of, of pressure down to zero is, I would say, ins inconsequential. I mean, it, who knows? It's a blip. Right. Um, it's something like that, would it cause us concern? Correct, right. correct. So and what, but when would it, are you, if you're saying only like a 30 day kind of thing, fine, that's a, a bright line. I'm just, I guess I just want to make sure I understand, 
or is, is my client or am I going to get a call like when when would DP start to get concerned about if those blips are becoming too frequent or yeah we definitely haven't talked about in terms of frequency you know if you have if you're out of your pressure range for you know whatever X amount of time over a time period we haven't discussed that um, so that is something we, we will discuss I guess um, and then we so we also had an issue and again I, I think this is Wi-Fi related not related to the actual fan and the function of the system but we lost connection this this line is misleading because it's uh, it shows a constant pressure basically across that time period which is about a week so um, that's a function of Excel and that's the way it is but we had no we weren't receiving data for that for that week um, we're trying to work with the uh, the owner to figure out why that happened if they they lost their Wi-Fi or what exactly happened but um, yep. it seems to me that with the performance standards we have now written in that if you set your range for your pressure because the LSP or whoever is setting that in the plan that range is for a month right like that's the average so if you take the average that month you're either in or out. I mean, that's what would be the notification. It yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm asking. Right. Because you already have that. I think I have to think. Like a time weighted average. Right. 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 Yeah. right. right. Over, over, over some month. period of Well, it has to be a month because month. that's the notification period. Right. Well, not no. once, not once you read that permanent no, solution. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so I'm, I, it's, it's about. Matter. It's not specified. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we should read the regs because I think yeah. also like yeah. DP is just saying like this is data we want to get. It's not. It's not. No, it's not like right. It's just data. It's just none proof of this, says that it's none working. None of this we were looking at. As it's not triggering a notification it. trigger. Right. Yeah. Okay. You still have that shutdown. If you still need the like loss of power to the fan. That's you gotta. Still have, that's right. still in well, well, in this, out for 30 days, you have to. Right, right. I, I get that. It, in this scenario, we, I don't want if someone were to do continuous vacuuming monitoring, if you lose power to the fan, you're going to lose the vacuum, and we could see that drop to zero. So Understood, but and this is why I think we need to wait and read what your regs say. Yep. <laughs> it matters if they're both there or not, and that's if both requirements are there, and that's the premise of this question. Because like, like the if it's one or the other, then we need to understand more clearly how mm -hmm. this triggers a, a 30 day starting period. But I think we should wait and read what you wrote. Like and or or. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> if it's and, I think it's fine. If it's or, this needs to be more specific. Okay, um, and then I guess the last thing we had another instance where it went out of uh, the vacuum range and that was a little bit longer of a period that was probably about four hours but so these two devices are also set up uh, to notify our email box as well and I guess this is something I wanted to point out when we lost this connection up here um, the assumption is that the the telemetry unit lost the connection to the router and therefore the our email box didn't get a notification so that's the example of it and I do think in this situation, I think the fan was functional, the system was functional, everyone was protected in this situation. It's a Wi-Fi related issue, but again, we had no, we had no knowledge of it happening based on the, e the email notifications. We knew it because we were getting constant feed and all of a sudden it stopped, um, but we didn't know. So. Who's the poor person looking at? Yeah. <laughs> What's that? Who's monitoring all of this? No, I. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's. This is fun. Oh yeah. You might, you might actually want to winter. check some of those um, pressure drops. You'll see the, the troughs and spikes. I have about ten data sets from a year of doing this, mm -hmm. and they'll correlate directly with barometric pressure at times. Well, I, I did have that thought, Isaac, and I, I mean, it, it still could be, but uh, the. The devices are right next to each other, and so I don't know. This is what I'm more worried about. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you know, that that very good. That would be telling us something. I'm glad I get rid This, yeah, I mean, it might. You know, if it doesn't come back, it would spur a call to say, right. okay, what's what's going on? This needs to be fixed. Yeah. This, if the Operating parameters have been defined to be something like that, and you start seeing this. This is more trouble over some period of time. Right, Again, like if that's a day, 
necessarily. Right, right. right. But we don't want you know, two weeks. I, I think operationally, you know, if we start seeing a trend and nothing is, is happening, then you know, I think we would we would want to have things set up so you know, people start working on it before it becomes a thirty day violation. All right, any, that's, that's it. So any other questions? <laughs> I'm going to run out of here before there's more questions. Thanks, Brian. And it takes 17 minutes. No. Uh, uh, <laughs> we're still trying to get everything in, so I'm, I'm going to go quickly. So um, I just want to remind you, we talked about temporary solutions a year ago, I look back, uh, we did like one of those focused discussions and we had a list of um, questions uh, for all of you. And uh, basically we were looking at, when we were listing things to address in the amendments, one of the things that kept coming up over and over again was lack of clarity in terms of what's required for temporary solutions, in which cases do you have to maintain a tier classification, when are RMRs and status reports required? When are they not? Um, so, so this was all um, this was all confusing, um, and some of it was okay. Most of it is due to the regulation. <laughs> well, most the the confusion is in the regulations is is created by the regulations, but there's also behavior behind it because when you look at actually um, how people are following the regulations there wasn't, didn't seem to be um, a, a real pattern where they had a permanent, where they had a temporary solution and it was feasible to get to a permanent solution and they were doing active O&M, they weren't submitting status reports and RMRs and in some cases where um, they, nothing was feasible and they were just monitoring groundwater concentrations, they are submitting status reports, so it was all over the, all over the place. So. Um, it made sense to clarify it, and that's really what we're trying to do in the reg changes. Um, the goal, clarify, eliminate inconsistency, uh, try to match the requirements to the situation in terms of what's, uh, what's appropriate to require for the different types of activities that are occurring at permit solution sites, and per, uh, uh, temporary solution sites, I'm sorry. And temporary solution sites are really a reflection of the full range of sites that we have. Some of them still have some pretty significant issues. Uh, some really are just waiting until they can document that the, the groundwater levels are now meeting standards, so it's just ongoing monitoring. Um, there are a mix of sites in terms of the types of sites. One concern uh, our staff had when we looked at um, you know, asking for more information or more regular information from temporary solution sites is uh, what would that mean for those homeowner oil tank uh, sites that are in temporary solution? So we did look at that, and um, there are very few of those. So I think there are 11 total where it's a temporary solution and, and it's a homeowner site. Um, so we, we tried to take that into account, too, that some of these really are pretty minor. Some of them also seem to be sites that have just checked out. They're not... Uh, it may have been that somebody uh, filed a temporary solution in the past and they think, they think they've done all they need to do under the MCP. We haven't received five-year periodic evaluations from them. Um, they never came in uh, to say whether or not something, it was feasible to get to a permanent solution. So that's another goal is to kind of reestablish the status of the full range of temporary solution sites. Uh, just to give you an idea of how many we have, it's 18% of our open site universe. Uh, the majority of them, so 506 of the 732, are permit solution not feasible. That may be that, um, that may overrepresent those, that category, because you'll recall that when we made that change where we made the distinction, the default was permit solution not feasible, so they're maybe um, PRPs that just didn't come forward and really reevaluate whether or not something was feasible. And um, so then roughly 30% are a permanent solution is feasible. And they may be doing active O&M in those cases, or we may, they said it was feasible, but they're still not, uh, still appear to not be doing anything currently. 
Uh, so the proposal is um, a number of different things uh, where active O&M is occurring, and that's defined in the regulations that either an active remedial system, um, IPOMS, or where they're doing an active remedial monitoring program that the six-month status reports and remedial monitoring reports would be required. So that's treating these sites like other sites, um, other open sites that are doing active O&M. Uh, for sites that aren't doing active O&M, uh, we would require an annual status report. However, uh, we would have, there would be flexibility there where they could propose an alternative uh, frequency where they would come in and say, based on um, you know the little concern about risk and exposures and and our activities are limited to this, we think um, you know status reports every five years that correspond with the periodic uh, evaluation are appropriate for that site. So we have it set up right now where they would submit that to us with a 21 day presumptive approval. Um, Tier classification, extent, a valid tier classification, and that means if it's expired and extension would be required in all cases. Uh, but if you're submitting the status reports, that would suffice for that submittal. So we would, we would say the tier classification remains valid. Um, we did have a lot of internal discussion about the value of tier classification extensions, and I'm, I'm sure that will be part of the comments that we get. Uh, there are some people uh, on our staff that think tier classification should um, be for life. Once you tier classify, you're tier classified. They have the value now of at least every two years kind of giving you um, an additional time on the clock for two years. You come back in and say the work's still going on. Here's what's doing. Here's what we're doing. But if we're getting that same type of information in status reports, then we're, we're thinking we can um, not require separate submittals. And we can, can maybe um, do something in terms of our online submittals to accommodate multiple things. And um, to, to clarification, just that the periodic reviews really only apply to those cases where nothing is feasible. We're, we're getting that from both types of temporary solution sites now. I'm just curious if there's like intentionally a distinction between Tier classification extensions are not required, like the way they are in RLS. It's explicitly like, as long as you maintain RLS, they're not required. Whereas right. here, it's like they are required unless you. Yeah, it, it's it's in the it's in the wording, but it it, it ha would have a similar effect to ROS. If you're making these status report submittals, you're it's more like you're making the status report submittals. You're considered tier. You're to have a valid tier classification. Would it be fair to say that as long as you remain in compliance? You could say it well, You could say it all, all sorts of ways, but it's, it, yeah. So the extensions are not required? Like, no extension required. You don't have to worry about extensions. Right, right. So that's, that's the gist of it, but mostly I wanted to present this to you um, to emphasize that um, there are probably many different ways to do this and many tweaks to work on. Uh, just present to you what our goals are for these changes and if you think about those and, and we welcome comments on other possible ways to do this. Okay, unfortunately we have a few minute, more minutes left. <laughs> and, Oh, we don't have any slides. You're really stalling. I know, I know. Well, because you know what's coming. Um, I want to talk about what is success. Um, oh, there it is. Okay, um, 
So Nancy Bettinger from the Office of Research and Standards couldn't be here today. So luckily, uh, so th this is another area where kind of, we're going. We are expecting a lot of comments uh, when the regs go out. So we wanted to give uh, a little discussion to to frame and preview uh, the discussion uh, to get better comments back. So questions for comments. Uh, so this is the exposure point concentration section. And as you remember when we've talked about it in the past, uh, the, the, the status quo now is basically go with that nice arithmetic mean, uh, do the 75-10 rule or other justification. Nice, simple, uh, but uh, there are questions about whether it meets the regulatory requirement you know, broadly of coming up with a, a conservative estimate of the mean, uh, given a lot of the variables that go into this, including where the samples are taken and how many samples are present, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's also, as you probably know, Massachusetts is a bit of an outlier with how this is viewed you know, among qualified environmental professionals and regulatory agencies across the country. So, so one one question for, and this will be for comment. We expect comments. Is you know, do we really need to do a statistical, a more uh, rigorous statistical evaluation of these, or can we just stick with the way we're doing it now, assuming the that we are going to uh, begin looking at a more rigorous statistical application for exposure point concentrations. Uh, but have some option for using this sim the current simpler status quo that we do now. And I, I believe we, we said that we are interested in and, and do want to look at that, that for, uh, and I think the way we phrase it is for, for simple sites, straightforward situations, are, there are a case to be made that the, the current way of using a straight mean uh, is appropriate and sufficiently conservative, particularly given how you know, the sample locations are chosen, so that the, the bias sampling, that, you know, that would be okay. So if we have that, take that approach uh, with different options, how do we determine, how do we write the criteria by which you determine which universe you're living in, whether a simple mean is appropriate or something more sophisticated. Having decided that something uh, more statistically rigorous is appropriate for your site, uh, there would be a question of how one goes about uh, looking at that and selecting which statistical approach would be appropriate for the data that you have in the type of contamination. And then having gone through that, we often talk in terms of using the 95% upper confidence limit on the mean uh, as the target value is valid. It would be used as the exposure point concentration, but that is not written in stone anywhere and that there are valid reasons for choosing a different target level within that distribution of means. So kind of the final question would be, given you're using a statistical approach, what are you going to use as the exposure per concentration within that distribution? So uh, the language we have, uh, this is the conservative estimate of the average concentration contacted by a receptor at the exposure point over the relevant exposure period. So. How do you identify that? So if it's simple, like a discrete source, and small, let's say 2,000 square feet, pull that out of a hat, why not? <laughs> Something you kind of would be appropriate to continue doing the status quo. Uh, uh, and that's based on kind of judgment sampling, bias sampling, uh, and then using the arithmetic average, the 75-10 rule, or you know, some other justification, if it fails the 75-10 rule, uh, would be appropriate. So if you have a different situation where it's a more complex situation, it's uh, a larger or some combination of the two or some other criteria, and we're really interested in criteria that could be used where the status quo isn't appropriate, then some more uh, statistical estimate of, of the mean probably combined with uh, more systematic rather than biased sampling. I mean, there's pluses and minuses and, and pros and cons and differences in there. Uh, some of the things that we're looking at is whether you can fit it to a distribution or not, or whether you should. 
So use, fitting it to a distribution using a parametric approach or using a non-parametric approach. Uh, when actually calculating the upper confidence limit on the mean, uh, there is software out there. I think we mentioned you know, back in 1993, this was incredibly difficult, which is one of the reasons we went with the mean. Now there are statistical packages out there. You know, a lot of people or everybody uses EPAs per, per UCL. There are other commercial packages. And then there's Microsoft Excel or other, not to push Microsoft, but or other uh, appropriate spreadsheet. I'd like Lotus123 myself. <laughs> and then picking the target uh, limit, the 95%, 90th, or some X percentage. If I want to really go out on the limb, and I didn't clear this with Nancy even putting in the slides, but theoretically, you know, if you want it to be really out there, you could have LSP justified percentile values for the upper confidence limit. You'd ha I, I think. I, you know, everything is on the table in this, and that's part of you know, what we're really stressing. We, we want to get good comments and recognizing that there may be comments on that. Uh, where we're going, I think, in writing the regulations is first having that choice between, uh, depending upon the criteria for the site, still allowing, I think, for the majority of sites, because the majority of our sites are relatively simple and straightforward, we continue to use the, the mean with the 7510 rule. But there are situations, and the trick is defining what those situations are, where using the statistics would be appropriate. We are having looked at it, and we would like your input and you looking at it. Uh, the way that we're, we're kind of landing right now is recommending a non-parametric approach, not trying to fit it to any particular distribution, and, and not necessarily you know, pushing one statistical pack, package uh, you know, uh, we included uh, for download. Hmm? It looks like you are. Well, we're we're using. I, I think this is. We're we're saying we would use Excel. We're we're not necessarily um, pushing. You see, how, we're not mandated. We're, we wouldn't mandate it. Uh, we we would try. You know, there are many cases where we would check calculations. Uh, our first step would probably just use Excel. We have access to. Uh, Pro UCL, of course, uh, and then uh, with this approach, I think we're looking at the 90th percentile rather than the 95th. Uh, we included uh, in the attachments for this presentation some spreadsheets. Uh, Nancy had gone through looking at some data and some examples. You know, we expect more. Or we expect we'll be doing more. We hope that you do more. Look at some of your data sets. Play with them. Play with different. Uh, distributions, different ways of calculating it. You know, there's no, there's a lot of variability in this. There's no one right answer uh, in this. And I think I keep going back to, for the more complicated sites where a statistical approach is appropriate, looking at some upper confidence limit on the mean is more conservative and more health protective and takes into account more of the variability and the, the uh, the factors that are present at the site than what we are doing now. And I think that is the, that's the way I'm looking at this and the measure that I, I, I'm going to be looking at the comments and what our approach is, is, is it, is it better than what we're doing now rather than trying to find the one right approach? Because quite frankly, you, you Google any of these approaches and there is enough written about and, and very strong opinions about one is better than the other, and if you do it this way, it's right, it's wrong, you're off by X percent or not, and there are all of these factors. But when it comes down to it, oh, I thought I had a thing there. So this is what you'll see, uh, the Chebyshev, Chebyshev. Am I saying that right? No, it, it intimidates me. Chebyshev is what uh, we're recommending uh, doing. There are different ways of doing it. As you see, we're doing it in Excel. Uh, even though, you know, whether or not you find these equations scary or not really depends on, I guess, how much math and statistics you had or you, that you remember. I know I have it. Um, but it's easy enough to put into to Excel. And what, what you're seeing, for, for example, this data set, 19 samples, uh, benzoyfluoranthine, the straight mean was 373. Uh, using Chebyshev approach, 95th percentile, Get you up above 
uh, 1,000 parts per million, the 90th is 857. Uh, you can look at these for different ways of calculating, and you'll get a range of values. Uh, you know, I don't want, I, I, I don't feel comfortable uh, and don't think we necessarily want to be in a situation where we're necessarily arguing between, between these because any of these approaches is more conservative and takes into account the issues that uh, we have with the straight mean uh, better than the straight mean. Uh, so we are looking for comments, suggestions, approaches, different ways of looking at it. And oh, yeah, depending on how you do it, you know, the median, you get 150 in this data set. The mean is 373, uh, 857, 95th percentile is 1076. And you could add into this your know, different statistical packages. If you use Chebyshev in the ProUCL software, you'll get different numbers as well. There is no one right answer. It's really where generally do we want to fall? Assuming we change to a different methodology and you, beyond the simple means for more complicated sites, what's the transition? I mean, we have sites that have been investigated for a long time. You know, investigative strategies are often developed with the risk assessment in mind and the data collection in mind. And that data set may no longer really be appropriate a different methodology, I mean, is it kind of like, oh well, change, you got to go back and redo all your, you know, you know, a site that is, was, you know, beyond phase two, or, you know, I mean, how does it affect the that site that's going to be less yeah. high so, yeah. well, so, so the, and I the, the quite, know the answer right, no, and, and, in and, and this, and this presentation is just to highlight issues that we want people to think about and comment on. So add that That's to this list what, right. of, in implementing this, some of these things, like for example, when we change standards, uh, we, we give that time you know, between, right. oh, okay, here's the final version, the, the effective date will be X. Right. And that gives some transition, which is appropriate for, for kind of that. Uh, I guess the way I would phrase this is given that the statistical analysis uh, may dictate sampling strategy prior to that, then you know, what would be the appropriate lead time for the implementation date for this? And one could write in the regs that effective you know, for sites you know, that are, you know, you know, for any site with of notification after you know, the date, the effective date of the regs, you know, the promulgation of the date, going forward. And for older sites, any, any submittal that comes in, you know, more than three years from now or something like that. I mean, there are ways of taking that into account. You have to think about it. Right, know. right, and, and, we'll, and we'll seek comment on that. I, yes. I just had two other things that I think would be important to think about when people are considering this, or two other questions that I thought of. Um, in addition, I think those are, those are appropriate as well, um, is what about post-remediation? Um, like right now, a lot of times, you, you, you know, you use the mean in the risk assessment, you have a problem, you do cleanup, and then you can look at the exposure point, again, that you're left with on, a, on an arithmetic mean basis, plus you have the whole thing that you can't create a hotspot through remediation. So uh, another question I have is, what's going to be the approach post remediation because I think it's going to get problematic with the exception or it's simple mean or or to just apply this with the exception that you can't create a hot spot post remediation so just another thing to think about and then another thing I thought about is the surrogate values for non detects um, yeah. you know in the, in the straight up mean people are using typically half the detection limit in a lot of these statistical programs, it's coming up with some kind of statistical, based on the variability of your data, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. They're extrapolating different values. So just another thing to think about for your non-detects, you know, what are we going to use and are we going to have different standards for the mean versus the some kind of alternate that you can see. Yeah. Okay. Lily, we've got that on tape, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. 
Jeanette? So at one point... Oh, oh right. She had her she had raised before. Yeah. At one point, through this discussion, as part of this to come out with a uh, sampling guidance. Has there been any discussion of that actually happening? Or? Uh, there, there, there has always been discussion of sampling guidance uh, going back. Um, the, I, one of the... I would say one of the benefits of uh, making some changes in this and having waited for, uh, you know, who's representing the LSPA? What, what year are we in? Are we celebrating this year? Uh, 20, 25, yes. Uh, so having waited 25 years to, to get to use of uh, UCLs for the mean, for the exposure point concentration, is that there is a lot of sampling guidance out there both from EPA and from other states. So I'm not sure that we have to reinvent the wheel for that. Although ORS is planning. <laughs> 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 anyway, this is in the works. It, it, I, don't, I doubt it would be uh, delivered as of the date of the No, it's not. Do you have other things that so, need to be a high priority? Um, and and let, let me rephrase my benefits then. Uh, that we can, that at this point, things that are unique to our program really have to be addressed, uh, rather than creating the underlying scientific, uh, you know, I don't want to say justification, but theories for all of this. So, uh, so I added some detail here. This is the same list, uh, but we are looking, you know. At, you know, what we're doing versus other states versus EPA, uh, recommending uh, at least as a first cut, Chebyshev with the 90th percentile. Uh, but all of these are their game for comments, and we really want to see comments. Yes. Yeah. So my question, my broad question, is just like, is that what is the driver behind this? Is it just to come in to um, sort of line with other regulatory agencies, or like, is there actual some real concern? that public health is not being protected given the approach that's been used over some years. That's one question. The second, really, which is just more uh, confusion issue is, are you going to do something about the UCL acronym? Oh, that God. It's going to just oh cause chaos. Like, for people that don't know what either term means, it's going to be really confusing. Yes, I, and that, that the confusion using UCLs for, for two different things, yeah, yes. Yeah, it's going to be a problem. Um, yeah, so we're going to mandate that that the other, the upper concentration limits uh, uh, no longer will be called UCLs; will be called UCLs. <laughs> you you have to say it as a word. Um, no, that that drives me crazy too. And we have been trying to think about different ways, upper and now. it's so far we have it in lower numbers. That's not going to be. Yeah. No. <laughs> That, that's a, I think I think uncles are still the best. Um, and then what was the first one again? Oh, oh, the the, the driver. Why? I I think it I, I think it is the, the continuing. Uh, you know what what is our most common uh, finding in audits? Come on, you guys know. Um, Na nat nature, nature and extent, nature. number of samples, that, which all lead, come down to, do you have enough data, is it adequate, is it appropriate, is it conservative for the EPCs? And it's, you know, we have tried our, for, for years trying to improve the quality of the, the nature and extent. It is the, still the, the number one uh, issue that we run across, and this is one piece of that, uh, that there is there, there is perhaps, and Nancy would hit me for saying it's focusing on sample numbers, for example. It's also the quality of samples, you know, where you take them and all of that. It's far more complicated than I'm going to simplify right now. But one of the things is it costs more to, to, to do better site characterizations. And right now, there isn't a, you know, we, we talked about this in the, it's kind of like bilge, oil in the bilge. Uh, there, there needs to be a trade-off, a uh, more explicit trade-off, where uh, in the absence of, of really good site characterization, and like I said, Nancy would kill me for this, uh, that there's inherent variability and issues that can partially be addressed by a statistical approach to the, the data you have. Yeah, I, I appreciate that concern, and, and that's real. It, I, my 
concern about this response to it is that this approach will seem to incentivize sampling in areas that are cool, which I'm not sure is an incentive that you want to set up. Here, I'm, 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 not, I'm not sure that that incentive doesn't exist now. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean, it, it, no, but in terms, no, it, I, I think it's a significant change in that the, the quantity, the, the amount of time and money that will need to be spent to make this work in terms of sampling clean areas will be significantly larger mm -hmm. than the length of lawyers are yeah. So all, all of these... We're looking for comments on it. Uh, and, and with that, uh, the next time we meet, Jenny will have, will have updated her presentation. Have you all met Jennifer Worf? Jennifer Worf is coordinating our reclamation soil work, among other things. Um, so yes, you can read it online. Any questions about reclamation soil? There's a really good graph in there about capacity, how much has been used, how much is still available. Uh, which is seven that's million tons. seven Still million available. tons of capacity available yeah, okay. on the existing permitted sites, yes. which is really cool. Yes, I haven't heard anything about soils crisis. Okay, well that's it. Thank you for for coming, uh, and we will probably be in touch by email during the summer, uh, and we'll let you know if we're going to have an August meeting uh, or whether we'll put it off till September. Jenny has an article coming out in the LSPA newsletter. Yes. Oh, and that will cover sooner everything. Sooner than the presentation. Check the, the upcoming issue of the LSPA newsletter for Jenny's insights.